It's spring training baseball brought to you by McDonald's. From McKechnie Field in Bradenton, Florida, the winter home of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Today, it's the Pittsburgh Pirates against the Boston Red Sox. And it is a beautiful day for baseball. Greg Brown with you along with a very, very special guest. We're so excited to have him along. No, no, not you. We have Steve Blast. We know that, Steve. It's Doc Emmerich Day today. Doc, what a real pleasure it is to have you with us in the booth today. Well, thank you. I appreciate your inviting me. This is like fantasy announcing camp, and so far Steve hasn't fined me, which is also unusual. That might happen, though, today, Steve. It might. We're going to keep a close eye on Doc, but what a treat it is, it is. to have us joining him. We've been fans of his for Forever. Yep. forever. It's going to be a real treat today. The Pittsburgh Pirates and the Boston Red Sox with Mike Doc Emmerich, the Hall of Famer in the booth with us. Stay tuned. The Pirates and the Bo Sox are coming up next. We are coming your way from Bradenton, Florida, the friendly city. And once again, a gorgeous day for baseball as Ryan Vogelsong makes his second Grapefruit League appearance. A couple of scoreless innings last Thursday against the Toronto Blue Jays. He returns to the Pirates, signed as a free agent over the winter. The longtime giant, originally drafted by the San Francisco Giants back in 1998 out of Kutztown State. And has been an interesting career. Made his big league debut with San Francisco two years after he was drafted. 2001 dealt to the Pirates with Armando Rios for Jason Schmidt and John Vanderwall after his second start. Tommy John surgery. And with the Pirates, just didn't work out. 2001 through 2006, up and down with the minor leagues. So he bounced around, went to Japan, and really said he learned how to pitch there in three seasons. In Japan, signed with the Giants. Had a great year in 2011. He went to two World Series, 2012, and two years ago with San Francisco, an ERA under three in the postseason for Ryan Vogelsong. So he certainly brings, Steve, a, a veteran presence to the mound. Yeah, he knows what it's all about. And, yeah, a lot of, a lot of success with the Giants and uh, hoping to have enough left in the tank. He's 38 years old, and uh, 
as you said, a good outing, uh, first time out. And uh, talking to Ray Searage, uh, he's looking for three innings or maybe around 55 pitches to stretch it out a little bit. So uh, we'll keep an eye on him, certainly, and uh, look for him trying to make a, uh, a little bit of uh, damage for the Boston hitters inside. Ray said they're going to try to press some of those right-hand hitters. Here's the lineup that Ryan Vogel's song will face. Tim Roberson, Blake Swihart, and Pablo Sandoval. Kung Fu Panda in his second year. Travis Shaw will follow. Then it's Ryan Hannigan and Brennan Bosch. Devin Marrero is the shortstop. Ryan Lamar in center. Juan Moncada, the Cuban defector. Well, we have uh, Rusne Castillo was the scheduled leadoff hitter on the uh, lineup sheet. And here he is, the Cuban defector, 28-year-old Rusne Castillo. In 80 games last year, hit 253 and a sinking liner fielded by Cole Figueroa. So we've gotten the business out of the way. You saw the UPMC stats on Ryan Vogelsong from last year. And here is one of the biggest Pirate fans of all time, Doc Emmerich. Doc, it is really a, a joy to have you here. You just love watching your buckos. Yeah, especially in this setting. Wind's blowing right to left. Nice breeze. If you're sitting down in the stands, it's perfect. Everybody come down and see these guys. If you can get down here, the weather's wonderful. And the baseball is really good. Yep, we are underway. It's great to have you here, Doc. Thank uh, you. Uh, we're not kidding when we say we're fans. Yeah. We, we watch you so much. Uh, it's incredible what you do. It's a treat to be with you. Thank you. It's it's fun to watch you guys, too, and that I can be here with the 71 hero and Kent Tacolby's down there, the 79. And Maz is back home. Yeah. Um, maybe not watching. Maybe he is. Yeah, but uh, he's, he's with us in heart. That's right. Doc Emmerich, who... Uh, Spends a lot of time down here in Bradenton, Florida. Yeah, taxpayer, from what I understand. Down the line and right. And Polanco will give chase. Blake Swihart's going to wind up with a double. And don't worry, we're going to put Doc to work as a play-by-play -play guy. I mean, that's what he does. He is a, a Hall of Famer. And there is Kent Tocalvi, one of the heroes of that 79 World Series team. Doc. For those that don't know, I know I've asked you several times how you became a Pirate fan. Uh, it was Bob Prince who did that in KDKA Radio back in 1959, and the team was becoming really good at that time. And, and so I was only, Elroy. Yes. I was only 5'7", <laughs> and uh, Elroy was my hero, among others, including Mazeroski. And so uh, I became a fan, and I have been ever since. There were some years that might have been dark, but they weren't dark for me. I just hung in there. We are going. We're going to we're going to dive into the Doc Emmerich scrapbook. Uh, so this is going to be a, a ton of fun. And we'll ask uh, maybe Doc to do the Pirates' defense here when we have a moment. As Pablo Sandoval, Kung Fu Panda, steps to the plate in his second year now with the Red Sox, and boy, there was a a lot swirling around Red Sox camp when he reported a lot of talk that he was going to get in shape over the winter, but. Yeah, he's still working on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a lot of work to do. Disappointing first year, hit 245 and chased a lot. Just like that, out of the zone. In fact, percentage wise, nobody swung at more pitches out of the strike zone last year in Major League Baseball than Pablo Sandoval. Got a couple of successful ex Giants battling here with Vogelsong mm -hmm. and Sandoval. Late on that one, so Figueroa actually moved over a little bit to the left of second base. He was directly behind it for the last pitch. An 0-2 count, just underway. Vogelsong's first start was a good one. Dotting that strike zone. And I don't think uh, the control is as much issue. That they want to make sure he's got enough, uh, enough steam left to uh, keep everybody honest and Go into the package with the rest of the pitches, but uh, uh, an honesty type fastball against major league hitters still at 38. And now two and two. Sandoval gave up switch hitting for a time last year, it was just awful from the right side, so he said he spent most of the winter working on his right handed swing. And John Farrell, great to see him back after uh, going through the lymphoma treatments. Tori Lavallo took over, his bench coach. 
They ended up 78 and 84, the Red Sox, last place in the East. And popped up Marte fighting that sun. And that's the second out. We're going to get to the Pirates' defense as Travis Shaw steps to the plate. And Doc will take us around the diamond. Doc Emmerich and Sandoval pops out. Rodriguez and Figueroa. Figueroa move him over a little bit behind second for that last batter and Hanson out in short right. But they'll they'll shift back perhaps now. No, it looks like they're going to go back to that again. And Morris at first with Marte, Ortiz, and Polanco in the outfield. And Cervelli behind the plate for the offerings of Vogelsong. Doc spent a lot of time in the clubhouse again today talking to a bunch of players, including Francisco Cervelli. Let's pitch a breaking ball to Travis Shaw. Stays up. Shaw hit 270 last year. But you you love, uh, as do many Pirate fans, just his, his attitude, don't you? He's a hockey guy, even though he doesn't admit to it. But he plays with an edge. He plays with heart. He's got emotion. And, and fans like to see mm -hmm. that. Yeah, there are some guys that wear that on their sleeve. He's one of them. You know, everybody loves the game or they wouldn't be at this level. But right. guys that wear it on their sleeve, like a Cervelli, like a, a Jose Lean, like a Sangi used to do. I mean, you, you just know they're having the time of their life out there. And Cervelli really conveys that, and the fans just eat it up. In the air to left. Look out, that wind really kicking up. And that ah. well out of here. Opposite field homer for Travis Shaw. Makes it a 2 nothing Red Sox lead. Well, that's the prevailing wind, and it is a jet stream out to left field. And uh, every once in a while, you see it blowing hard out to right. But most times, when you get a strong wind, it's blowing that way. And that ball was, was well hit, but probably would have been held on the warning track. But uh-uh, too high, and just sailed on out. It happens a lot in these games. Left field home runs. And that ball out over the plate, but probably not far enough out over the plate. If you're going to throw it out there, you want a little sink to it, perhaps a little further out, have it running away from that left-hand batter. Travis Shaw, 7 for 12 now, the early going of spring training. He wants to make it tough on John Farrell. Doesn't want to concede first base to Hanley Ramirez this year. Strike is called on the veteran catcher, Ryan Hannigan. And there's a slider thrown by Ryan Vogelsong, a little bit up higher than he wanted it to be. Got to call a strike. But uh, you don't get away with all of those in that location. I like that better, and he didn't get a call. Tom Hallion behind the plate. On the bases, Bob Davidson, Paul Emmel, Phil Cuzzy. In the air, and Danny Ortiz will give way to Gregory Polanco. So the wind helps that one. Mm -hmm. So a couple of hits and a home run underway. 2-0 Boston. The Bucks come to bat. Sox two run homer from Travis Shaw for Ryan Vogelsong coming your way from Bradenton, Florida. That new look logo, interstate look that's not only on the field here at McKechnie, but on the sleeves of all the players. And in Arizona, they've got the AZ. 
take a look at the Pirates lineup. Alan Hansen will be coming to the plate. Then Francisco Cervelli and Gregory Polanco was second on the team last year with 35 doubles. Starling Marte will be hitting cleanup. Michael Morse at first. Danny Ortiz, minor league free agent signing over the winter, is in center. Then it's Sean Rodriguez, Cole Figueroa, and Ryan Vogelsong. Our RAV4 starting lineup against former Cardinal Joe Kelly. Yep. Broke in with the Cardinals. Uh, did some really good work first couple of years. Uh, over with Boston now. Really had a, a terrific uh, first full year with the Cardinals. 10 and 5. Uh, it's 269 ERA. Did good work in the postseason. And uh, then dealt. Rick Sofield, as usual, at third base. Who's that down at first? Omar. Speedster. <laughs> Omar Marino. Nick Leva has been uh, working on occasion, including the other day, the regular first base coach over on a side field with John Jaso, getting that work in at first base. Rick Sofield, third base coach. Alan Hansen, been fun to watch, Doc. Six for 11, a walk and a strikeout, the early going, and a guy who was trying to at least start the year in the big leagues. And there's a chance that that can happen with that whole, that whole gung situation as he continues to get better and better and get closer and closer to being game ready. A lot of speculation as to when that will be. A lot of we know it's going to be late to, to mid-April. Yeah, and, and operative words in that order. Pirates kind of think late. Gung things mid. And that's what Hanson can do with that great speed. Slaps it past the pitcher, and he gets called out. But you know he was safe. We yes. saw it from up here. They can't be in that big a hurry yet, can they? Bob Davidson apparently is over there. I thought they had him at first. Do you really? Yeah, I do. Wow, okay. Well, let's take a look. Doc and I disagree with you, Steve. And don't know. I always tried to befriend the umpires. Yeah. Well, I tend to see with my heart, not my eyes, when it comes to the black and gold anyway. So well, that, that was a great try, and that's got to be part of his mm -hmm. uh, his uh, skill set, that he can do that, get the ball uh, and drag it past the pitcher, and then all bets are off. And most of the times, he is going to be safe. That's a That was a terrific bunt. And a heck of effort. a play there by Moncada, yep. second baseman. Here is Francisco Cervelli, one for seven at the plate through the first week of spring training games. Another look at that. Play at first base. Moncada quickly. Just nipped him. Yeah, just did. Uh, a, if Moncada's still in Cuba, we got a base runner. We, we got one on, nobody out. Hanson <laughs> just did beat that throw. The ball goes into the dugout, and he's at second. There we go. So Cervelli. They went 295 last year. And turned 30 on Sunday. And just one of the many players that uh, Doc Emmerich visited with. Earlier today. Well, you picked the right guy to talk to. He, uh, he's upbeat. He, he's a joy. You know, he's animated. There's energy there. It's, uh, it's always fun to kind of engage him and see what he's thinking on a given day because he thinks about a lot of things. I asked him what he had done before catching. He said shortstop and pitcher. He's built like that. Yeah. But I admire his heart and his edge, and he said I've always been that way ever since I first started playing. And there was one stat that I was surprised at when I saw in all of the major leagues, from the seventh inning on, he has the best batting average last year, 357. Nobody in Major League Baseball had a better batting average from the seventh on. How about that? Uh, that and those usually are meaningful hits. Clutch yeah. usually, right? Yeah. 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 And he said, make sure you mention it. He didn't know either. See, that's, that, that. that's the great. He can have some fun. That's yeah. the yeah. great thing about him. And he stayed healthy all year. That, that, that was, you know, he had a reputation being a little bit brittle, but uh, he took a beating all year long, kept on getting up. And toward the right center field gap, that wind will knock that down. Ryan Lamar makes the play. Center fielder for Boston this afternoon as they made their way up from Fort Myers, a couple hours south of Bradenton. Joe Kelly. Involved in a trade from St. Louis. This is his third year with the Bosox. 
Yeah, and it's an easier trip than it used to be. There was uh, no 75, I-75 uh -huh. for a long time. You had to come up uh, old uh, US-41, speaking of uh, old highways, and uh, there were only about two or 300 lights you had to go through on your bus. Easier trip now. Now Polanco. When you came up here from Fort Myers as a pirate, which team were you coming up here to play? We would we would come up to the the White Sox really early. Uh, played at a place called Arthur Allen Field, uh, downtown Sarasota. Uh huh. And that was the shortest trip we had from Fort Myers. It was it was a long long bus ride everywhere. Doc, I knew every Morrison's uh, cafeteria on US 41. <laughs> we we ate it all of them and, and we made it count back in the day. And of course, when I was down there, I was a minor leaguer, so I had to make every trip. So get on the bus, kid. So the White Sox. Initially, we're in Sarasota yep. when when you were busing up from Fort Myers. Yep. Yep. Fired started training here in 1969. And Doc, you fell in love with the Bucks in 1959. Did you tell us yeah. your your first game? Yeah, in Chicago at Wrigley Field, mm. August 9th. Not that I forget. No. Yeah. Really. <laughs> August 9th. Elroy won it 15th. Yep. Against that's awful. <laughs> Let's go ahead and say it. I'm not Listen. having, not Let's having fun it. yet, but we will. He's going to do here. some play by play. Get it out of here. <laughs>the Red Sox lead the Pirates 2-0 going to the second inning. There is a Roberto Clemente fan. We see a lot of those mm. Clemente jerseys in spring training throughout the season. And this is this? one of the items that Doc Emmerich brought with him. That scorecard, Doc, what's the date? It's uh, August 31st, 1968. How about that? I was just out of college, and uh, a friend of mine, Gary Nash, and I drove out from Indiana to see that game between the Atlanta Braves and Pittsburgh Pirates. And Satchel Page pitched batting practice for the Braves. And Steve Blass How about that? got one guy out, went out to left field, played for one batter, came back in, finished the game, did not get a complete game. Or, or gave up no runs, didn't get a shutout or a win. Or a, yeah, got the win. For the reason of what? Elroy Face, uh, we found out he was going to be traded to Detroit, and he needed one more appearance to set a National League record for games pitched. And so uh, we made a plan that I was going to start after one batter. I was going to go out. Elroy came in. See, Teak wasn't the only one to play left field, <laughs> but he made a catch. So he's got the edge on me. <laughs> and, and, and Henry, Henry Aaron's up, uh, getting ready. But what am I going to do when he comes up? You know, go, go out uh, in uh, Shenley Oval and, <laughs> and get ready for a ball. <laughs> but that was, uh, that was weird. Okay, uh, yeah, one out. We're going to make a pitching change. So Elroy, Elroy got his appearance. 802 of them, mm -hmm. and the record later broken by Troy Hoffman of San Diego, but not until 2007, so it's it held a long time. He tied Walter Johnson for that record, most appearances with one team, and as I understand it, Steve, that they asked 
Elroy, if he wanted to start that game, he said no. <laughs> he wanted to yeah, why go out as a reliever. Street? That's right, yeah. And ironically, Elroy Face was a very successful starter in his early days mm. in the minor leagues. Very successful. Elroy's probably tuned in today. Well, Elroy's doing well. He's a, he's a great pirate. He's a great friend. He and, uh, he and Ronnie Klein taught me a lot of things. <laughs> oh, boy, did they ever. One of which is send my liver out once a week and have it cleaned and pressed. <laughs> <laughs> Shot there of Kent to Colby. And a fly ball to right field. Polanco just now picking it up as Brennan Bosch uh, flies it. Oh, drops out of the mitt of the cat of the uh, right fielder Polanco. Well, you don't even have to relate to that verbally. You, you saw it. Uh, he just flat out kicked it, dropped it. We used to say there's a can of corn. Bob Prince said that once and got burned. Here's another one. And there is no can of corn at McKechnie Field. No, that's uh, that's that's inexcusable. But, uh, the, the sky, the wind plays havoc on these fielders. But that's a ball that uh, Polanco, you can see, just clanked out of his glove. Here now, Devin Marrero. You know, even if you're not out here before the game checking all that out, you've seen a fly ball fly to left field. You've seen two of them get knocked down in right field. So you've seen two balls get caught in right field that were knocked down. So uh, he, he probably will tell you the same thing. There's no excuse for that. Broke Try it, it again. Yeah, pop up. Squeeze it. You know, he gets the cheer, the Bronx cheer. But, uh, you know, you see those kind of things, they happen. There's uh, no reason be behind a lot of them. But you as a pitcher gives you the opportunity, if you keep your wits about you, you can get one of your guys that you depend on a lot off the hook. And it's been that way for 100 years. And you feel real good if you walk in and not let that runner score because you picked up your right fielder. So that's one of the things that hasn't changed in our game. So at second base, Bosch, the air charged to Polanco. And Ryan Lamar, who spent last year in the Reds organization, was two for 25 at the plate with Cincinnati. Most of the year spent at AAA Louisville. A Royal Oak, Michigan native, Ryan Lamar. You're from which, what part of the state? Um, near Port Huron. Hmm. Not far from Royal Oak. Undoubtedly hmm. raised a Tigers fan. The runner at second and one out. Here in the second. And pulled to third. There's Sean Rodriguez. Two outs. Well, if you're a movie fan, is there any way you can not call him Headley Lamar for Blazing Saddles? <laughs> <laughs> it's Headley. <laughs> Here's Joan Moncada. One of uh, a couple players who played in Cuba. Red Sox invested $63 million in him. $31.5 million signing bonus and $31.5 million for exceeding the allotted bonus pool for inter international signings. 21-year-old Yoan Moncada. Takes a look at a nice-looking slow curveball from Ryan Vogelsong. So he's two-thirds of the way of picking up his right fielder. One ball and one strike. Evidence of being a deep pocket team when you can just come up with say, that kind of cash, boy. isn't it? Boy, they just to buy the rights yeah. and then start talking about salaries. There's all the money they spent on David Price this offseason. Consecutive last place finishes. They hired Dave Dombrowski away from well, Detroit after he was fired by the Tigers. And well, Vogelsong does get Polanco off the hook by inducing that ground ball to Michael Morse. 2-0, Boston.
PMC scoreboard, a 2-0 Red Sox lead heading to the bottom of the second inning. Here at McKechnie Field, big crowd as expected. A lot of Red Sox fans joining so many Pirate fans on a sun-splashed afternoon. And Starling Marte, who's 4 for 9 at the plate so far this spring, leads off against Joe Kelly. Solid numbers. Solid hit, but foul. Yep. How good is Marte going to be? It, it's going to be That's interesting to, to, yep. to see along on the way because it, it's possible that he could really be special. I mean, he could be a 30-30 guy, couldn't mm -hmm. he? Yes. 19 homers last year and uh, 30 steals. Yep. Drove an 81. He's going to be fun to watch for a while. And at least until Gong returns, we're figuring that Marte will hit cleanup. It's interesting because the Pirates are going to have to find a way to replace 49 home runs between uh, Alvarez, Ramirez, and Neil Walker. That's a, that's a lot of power. So they're going to have to be more creative. They're going to have to really get creative. Shallow right going to drop in in front of Brennan Bosch. He was jammed on it, fought it off, drops it into right. And we'll see if Marte doesn't take off here. Season ticket membership, year-round access to events and experiences. For more information, go to Pirates.com slash membership. You get unprecedented year-round access to exclusive events. Plus those experiences, choose from full season, half season, or 20-game plans. And customize your membership by selecting the experiences you want. Go to Pirates.com slash membership for more details. They're experiencing a nice game in those chairs, those lawn chairs. Michael Morse. And there goes Marte right away. And he's in there in a weak throw from Hannigan, the stolen base for Starling Marte. These umps are good. They are so good. <laughs> as, as you were saying earlier, Doc. Yep. Well, you'd probably see the Pirates running a good bit more to try to be more creative. That is the 10th stolen base this spring by the Pirates in 16 attempts. And this is game number nine. Can you imagine if you had Marte on one base, you had McCutcheon on another, and if Hansen makes it, oh. and he was a, a, a scratch hit to right field or down the line, they might all three come around. Mm -hmm. It would be fun to watch. Yeah, or, or load the bases and bring Polanco into the equation. See if he can catch them all with those <laughs> long strides. He does get out of the box oh. fast, doesn't he? It seems like it's three steps between first and second once he gets going. The length of the strides. Michael Morse is 5 for 11 at the plate this spring. Fights that one off. You know, one of the things sitting home watching the telecasts all summer is I love the cutaways to fans. And I can listen to you guys, but I can watch the fans and I see so many of them at PNC watch, uh, wearing the black and gold. And young people. And there was a time you didn't see yeah. that. Look that at is the gear so there. All decked out in pirate paraphernalia. Well, it's relevance again. Yep. And yep. some of us saw a time when it wasn't the case, but it sure is now. And past the pitcher, but the second baseman, Moncada, will throw out Morris. Still gets Marte to third. And these are the little things, too, that uh, as Steve was talking about, where you might not uh, have the power... So you've got to go elsewhere and find ways to score those runs. So you got to do the little things right. Yeah, and it's a thin line because you don't want to run into outs either. Mm -hmm. So what are they, 10 out of 16? Right. You'd like the percentage to be higher. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's why you're working on it down here. Now Danny Ortiz with the infield back, the exception being Pablo Sandoval. Ortiz, a left-handed hitter, signed as a minor league free agent by the Pirates, and that'll get the run home. You know, the Red Sox got creative for us. Yeah. Well, two to one. Easy sometimes to get confused with PB for pass ball, but this is a WP for wild pitch, and it was really a wild pitch. Oh. What do you put down in your card there, Doc? 
Just a WP? WP, yeah. yeah. That covers it. Didn't yeah. have it that day in 68. There weren't any. <laughs> Last was flawless. Really? Scattered five hits. Didn't get the shutout. Mm. Ortiz rolls it to second. He is two for 14 in his first spring. So that was uh, that was the year of the pitcher, 1968. Yeah. Bob Gibson, how about this, Doc? He's got a 1-1-2 ERA, and he goes 20 and 9. Who beat him nine times? <laughs> I mean, how can that happen? Well, Denny McLean passed 30 wins, yeah, and they yeah. lowered the mound. Yeah, but the interesting thing, too, before that, in 67, the mound was still the same height as True. it was in 68. Mm -hmm. True. And uh, it, it, it was just... It, it, there are some things in all sports that you don't have answers for. Who knows? What was in the uh, the water? Who was? Uh, how much? What was in the water that year? Water was probably better for the liver, wasn't it, Steve? On occasion. Back then. Yeah. Back when, then. Yeah, when you needed a rinse and repeat. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and two on Sean Rodriguez, four for eight at the plate. Doc, there's another factor here. There's a, a slant in front of us. And if you get a foul ball, just duck because these things hit and they don't go straight up. They come right back at you like bullets, like the old Detroit Stadium. You can see it's dented up. Yeah. Right? So balls. Uh, foul balls, uh, yep. you hit the deck. He was in, he did uh, some radio with John and me, Doc, a few days ago. Oh, okay. So, so he had some action. I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Okay. Adam Elmore, our producer, had me sign off on several things, yeah. just short of death. Mm -hmm. um, well, did so it's a high-risk policy. Yeah, did John warn you about this? Yes, he did. A, a good yeah. color man will do that for you. <laughs> two and two, 93 from Joe Kelly. You sit down in the stands where I do, and I've been down to three games already this, this week. And when the players parade by, they love this guy at the plate. And they love it because he's he plays with an edge, and it matters to him. And, and you again, talked about it's earlier, and this is the same way with same Sean thing. And it's, it's yep. like you said, it's it's hard on sleeve, but yep. it's genuine. Yeah, and yeah. You it, know it matters to this it's guy. It's legit, yeah. yeah. That's where Doc yeah. sits right around there. Sure enough. Uh, that's... And yep, right in that area. Exactly. Gosh, you guys are good. That's Pete Toma, best director in the biz. Adam El Elmore, the best promoter, uh, producer and promoter in the biz. He's promoted us pretty <laughs> yes, well. He has. He? <laughs> there we are. How about the youngsters? That cap aside, Doc, good to see him with the sign. <laughs> there, there, there's something about spring training baseball, too. It's, it's intimate. The players are closer. It's more personalized. The sun's out. It's just a, it's a different field than the regular season, but it still has that feel of afternoon baseball, and it's still good stuff. Mm -hmm. Afternoon baseball is hard to beat. There will be just a couple of night games at uh, McKechnie Field this spring. And it's easy for me to say, come on down here and see this, but if you can plan ahead, you know, there are some really decent fairs the latter part of March from Pittsburgh, and, you know, the Red Sox are coming in, and I know they're... There are some empty seats today, not a lot of them, mm -hmm. but if you plan ahead, you can, and it's... We got a surprise at the end of the game the other day on one of those, and I think that was... Oh, yes. Yeah, that's yes. why I've been a little skeptical yes. today. I think they wanted to go home the early. The game that ended a double play yeah, with the line of the shortstop. I know, yeah. yeah. Greg, what did Danny Ortiz do? I have WW. I wasn't watching. 4-3. So. <laughs> Thank you. That's what Doc has in his scorecard. Mm -hmm. This is Cole Figueroa. He's trying to figure into the mix. A left-handed batter who is two for 13 at the plate, has just a little bit of big league experience, a utility player who has bounced around all the infield, a little bit of outfield play this spring. Clint Hurdle trying to find out what they have in Cole Figueroa. And speaking of Cole, Garrett Cole is scheduled to uh, work a bullpen session, I believe, tomorrow. And then uh, thinking that the next time you hear his name is probably going to be when he appears in a, in a spring training game. So, what are you uh, hearing, Doc? Sunday, right? Yeah, yeah I heard, heard this morning okay. Sunday. So okay. that's a Detroit something to game. look forward to. Yep. That'll be up in Lakeland against the Tigers. 
what a year he had last year. I mean, he, he pitched like a stud. Mm -hmm. He really pitched like a stud. 19 wins. Standing alongside Jeff Locke and to his left, Jeff Livesey, assistant hitting coach for the Pirates. Speaking of Jeff Locke, a very strong appearance, what, two days ago? Mm -hmm. Three really solid, good-looking innings, tight, efficient. There goes Rodriguez on a 1-2 pitch with two outs. Sean Rodriguez was taking off. Cole Figueroa, who was signed as a minor league free agent over the winter. Yeah, we just got a fine doc. Yeah, uh, that's uh, a, that's, that's a it. There's that's the fine. I, I gave him 20 when I came in. You well, just work off that, but what's the fine, 40? Well, I thought I had that turned down. Well, just, <laughs> you know, the, the, the phone came on. That's a buck. The fine for, for uh, cell phones on, $21. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm 20 is good. Wow. You'll, you'll oh. be one more and we're good. There is an ATM downstairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll, I'll be there. I'll be right there with you. <laughs> okay, let me turn this thing on. <laughs> I like the, I like, it's, I like it's, the chimes. It's Doc, let's keep that on. It's a catchy tune. Yeah, we could go to a break with that. Let's go to a break with that on, Doc. We do have a fine in hockey for that. Do you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that. boy. Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, my. I was too relaxed today. How my images get. Shattered. I know. Shattered. Tarnished. Two and two. S speaking of the phone, we got a tweet uh -oh. from uh, PBC Breakdown. The biggest news of the offseason is that Steve Blast now has an iPhone. Should dramatically change Root Sports broadcast. Steve, you tried to take a picture of us earlier, and you struggled a little bit, so Robbie S. Mikowski had to help. But you're just learning. The iPhone. I, I, you know, I wanted to give him the opportunity to do the right thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it down now. I expect to get a lot of calls from my buddies. Doc, up until about a week ago, he had been calling that device a car phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, did he have a flip phone before that? He did. Well, Is that what you did? I didn't realize that was what the flip meant. I, I just got it open last month. <laughs> I, I opened it up. It, it opens up, and you can do a lot of stuff with it. You know, I'll bet that call was from the truck. It was a local uh, uh, area you. code. That's yeah. what it was. Yeah, yeah. A lot of streets named after those guys. One way. Yeah. <laughs> there he goes again. And on a 3-2 pitch with two outs, he did take off. There's ball four. Always good to hear from John Wayner. Yeah. The Rock four. What's you know, that mean, it, The Rock four? Well, now, now four. Doc played for, for Wayner at the Fantasy Camp a couple years ago. What, what would that mean, Doc? R rock four? Uh, he hit four home runs in his career. However, oh. one of those was the last one at... Three rivers. Mm -hmm. Those are details. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is, if I'd have played longer, only three behind. It's only three behind. Who did you hit your home run on? Well, if we got a few minutes, Doc. Uh, <laughs> you, don't, you don't remember much about it, though, do you, It's Steve? been such a long time, but it was September 5th, 1969, Mass's birthday. <laughs> Wrigley Field, Ken Holtzman was a pitcher. 73 degrees, 43% humidity. 26,412 people in the stands. There were two men on. Kind of an overcast day. Detail's still a bit sketchy for but, you. Uh, yeah, the rest of it's kind of vague. Yeah. But the great thing, Doc, was I ran down to first base, and Don Leppert, the coach, said, take a left. <laughs> I, I'd usually peeled off and went to the right into the dugout. So that was it. Where did it go? Good. The catwalk? In Wrigley? At, at least. Yeah. At least. I mean, it was out of sight. Uh, sure A lot was. of people yeah. referred to it that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the great thing was, the, the neat thing was, I pitched a four-hitter that day, and Billy Williams went four for four. If he's sick that damn in yeah. Cooperstown. Right, that's right. <laughs> See, Doc, you haven't heard this stuff. Greg, Greg, his, <laughs> he's, he's filled with disgust now. He's no. only heard these things 80,000 times. It's still funny. <laughs> Ryan Vogelsong is at the plate. Uh, Clint Hurdle, much like he did last spring, about a oh, week maybe of uh, DH use, but then he wants his starting pitchers to get some at-bats. Greg, I'm going to test your memory. When Vogelsong left us that spring, I don't know if we can check it. He hit the ball like crazy. He had a huge spring with the bat. Ryan Vogelsong, the year before he left, or the year, the, well, we'll, yeah, the year he did leave. We'll have to check that for sure. But maybe not. Maybe it was somebody else. What's guy hitting? And a call oh. third strike with uh, Tom Hallion's exaggerated call there. I'm going to be quiet. 
Steve Blass is here with us, as is Doc Emmerich. Doc's going to call a couple innings of play-by-play -play coming up. Ah, the memories of number 28. UPMC scoreboard, Red Sox leading it 2-1, to one, going to the third inning here at McKechnie Field in beautiful Bradenton, <laughs> Florida. We understand the weather is beautiful in Pittsburgh, and we're getting a ton of tweets. A bunch of folks thrilled to hear the Hall of Famer, Doc Emmerich. Doc Emmerich on Root Sports right now, talking baseball. What? Listen to Doc Emmerich on Root Sports. Calling the Pirates game is music to my ears. Doc Emmerich calling the Pirates isn't something I thought I needed, but I need it. That's kind. Those are the polite ones. <laughs> uh, good stuff, that's, Doc. That's all that's you nice. get from the... Hey, Doc, I, I got to ask you. You really... Do you really need a color guy when you're doing a hockey game? It's so fast and there's so much action. Seriously. Oh, yes, yes. When play stops, you need to not only catch your breath and... and Old joke, you're right there, right? Uh, I just didn't. It's terrible. Right. <laughs> well, Doc, you but say yeah, you do. Re respect Doc, to Doc, the old So, so you, you do need a color analyst in hockey. L look yes. at him. Look at, you the interest. Ask, uh, look at the ask interest. Him. Yeah, ask about the play-by-play -play guy in baseball. Do you need a color no. analyst? No. Oh, no, you do. You need a play-by-play -play guy? Is that the question? Base hit to left field, and Castillo is on. There you go. One for two. So early in the third, Vogelsong has yielded his first, and Blake Swihart comes in, designated hitter. No, it's a good question. I mean, not everybody, even in hockey, still works with a color commentator. Some guys work alone. Chuck Caton, who's done the games in Hartford and Carolina, ever since 1979, has worked alone really? on radio all these years. And you'd think if there was a breathless call of hockey, it would have to be radio. It, it go, with all due respect, the old two-niner. <laughs> yeah, well, and Edso. I mean, and, 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 our and buddy Bobby Ari, yeah. Eddie Olchick yeah. with, uh, teamed up with Doc Emmerich on NBC. I mean, that best pair around. I love, by the way, what uh, Chris Mad Dog Russo said on the MLB Network yesterday. Doc was on yesterday talking about uh, with Mad Dog on, uh, on his program. It's uh, usually at 1 o'clock on the MLB Network. And he introduced you. It's so well said. You are the Vin Scully of hockey. And I mean, oh, and it, yeah. I just thought that was so well, that uh, covers it. Yep. That covers it. Inside again. Two balls, no strikes here. Swihart doubled in the first inning and scored a run. Two to one here in the top half of the third in favor of the Red Sox. They are hoping for a bounce back, these Red Sox this year. Inside, but called strike. Yeah, and they're they're needing one, and they're going to try to lead the way with Price, of course. Uh, uh, getting that stud, they're hoping that sets a tone, not only with what he does, but the influence he spreads around that ball team. Price is going to pitch tomorrow at home against Minnesota. That'll be a home-and-home -home game. They're both down in Fort Myers. Wonder who the home team will be. Probably flip a coin. <laughs> Three and one. 
The other question I want to ask you, Doc, uh, what about all the names? That, because there's a lot of names that aren't so-called American names, the, the European, the, uh, the Russian names. Uh, th- that can't be easy. It cannot be easy. I don't care what you say. It can't be easy. <laughs> I do care what you say. <laughs> <laughs> Fouled off three and two. And a lot of it is just um, once you learn them once, as long as the player doesn't, doesn't want to change it. For example, we learned Temu Selani the first year that he was in Winnipeg, and then the PR people convinced him to say Solani. And so he said, okay. But normally, once you learn them, it's like going to a movie the second time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the plot changes a little bit, but the characters remain the same. And so even the polysyllabic names that are long, you guys have the same challenge here in baseball. Not as much, I don't think. Not as tough. I, I, I'm amazed that you guys do that. Down the line and fair. Swihart has drilled it down the line. Castillo comes in to score, and Swihart is standing at second base with his second double of the game. And it is now 3-1. to one. Well, he pulled it the first time. This time, I think he might have hit the chalk down the right field line, and the race was on. And it takes a long time to get down into that corner. The Red Sox get it going in the third, and they cash in right away. Look at how close that is. That, that is very close to the chalk. He gets the call. And then they're off and running. Of course, easy for him to follow uh, when he's running to first base, knowing he's got a comfortable jog into second. He can see everything right in front of him. One so, thing that you do get here as Vogelsong causes Sandoval to rip is you do get pitch counts, which the fans here do not get, and you also get the velocity of the pitches, which they do not get either thanks to Root Sports. Mm-hmm. And you had mentioned 55, so he's at 37 right now. Yeah. 0 1 to Sandoval. 0 oh, 2. Had a rip both times. Okay, so you're thinking like a pitcher now. You come through with a smoke this time? Well, you, you've got a lot of options because he is a swing and a miss type of a hitter. So you got him 0 2. You can try. Any, any one of two or three different pitches, what you want to do is now is, is stay out of the strike zone, see if he'll chase again because he's trying to protect the plate now. So he might chase anything that's borderline. So you can, okay, you tease him outside like that. You, the, the great cat and mouse game is that, uh, is Sandoval going to think, okay, he showed me that pitch out of way. Is he going to try to come back in now? And now I'm thinking that I could protect in there, and what if he stays back outside? And so that's, uh, that's the advantage you have as a pitcher now. Let's, let's see what uh, Ryan decides to do. Down the line and foul. See, he stayed away, and Sandoval actually did a good job of just getting wood on that, uh, on that pitch, staying alive. So he's very much in a defensive mode. Uh, now, he's the kind of guy that... Uh, you can't say that 100% because he just likes to turn it around. He likes to turn it loose. There are some guys that will shorten up now and try to make contact. He's probably more of a free swinger that says, okay, yeah, I'm going to jam it at spring training. I can take a rip. What, what harm is it going to do? Well, still, advantage, vocal song. Now he comes back inside and ties him up. A nice job. Ryan working back and forth. Rodriguez with the grab. One out and still Swihart at second. Make your next group outing the event of the year at PNC Park. Put together a group of 15 or more and receive special discounts. Ask how you can get one-of-a-kind experiences like watching batting practice from the field or being a part of pregame on-field activities. Find out more by going to pirates.com slash groups. Well done, Doc. They won't let me do those things. They They don't? No, that's... I have to sign a waiver for that, like your (laughs) waivers that you sign. (laughs) Uh, what, what a great shot that was, Doc. You were talking earlier about seeing uh, young fans at PNC Park, and uh, it, it just there's something special, the bond between the, the fans and their baseball team. And this young fan has himself a souvenir for life. Yep. A baseball. That, that's what they do. They get the, and they start looking at it. Yeah. Right. And that's just, it's wonder. They have that, mm-hmm. that Major League Baseball. They want to know everything about what, what's written on it, how many stitches there are, whose name, uh, the logo, all that stuff. It's, uh, it's great to be a kid with a baseball. It's just great to be a kid with a baseball. Shaw parked one out there that was a souvenir in the first inning. Yeah, they may have had to chase it for a while, but eventually it became a souvenir. And if you're coming down, get here and get inside fast. The gate's open for a 1 o'clock game at 11, and you go out on the boardwalk. 
And there come the balls in batting practice. Mm -hmm. So you got a good chance to get one that you can carry home inside and a walk. So first and second now with one out. Pitch count up to 45. Boardwalk, they added a couple years ago, and what an addition to this uh, historic ballpark. That polished it off. It really did. See, when you first started coming here, oh. it's 93 years old, this place. I don't want to be cruel, but it was not looking great uh, <laughs> in 1969. Uh, it's... Uh, it's been a constant project. I mean, they've improved the surface. They've done things for the fans, the stands, the clubhouse, the amenities, the boardwalk, the tiki bar. Uh, this this is a gem. This is an absolute gem. We have the best ballpark in America at the major league level in Pittsburgh, and we've got the best Florida spring training ballpark. So what a combination. But the city and the, and, and the Pirates, it's been a great relationship. Uh, they've, they've gone hand in hand. There was a time when we thought we might leave here. And my wife and I took a, a ride up to a city I won't name, town I won't name, and we drove back depressed because we had rented out on Anna Marie Island, which is just a, a jewel, and uh, we thought we might have to go. But uh, they, they've worked everything out, and it's, it's, it's been great. Uh, Mayor Wayne Poston uh, has kind of led the way for uh, the city, and, and the, the county people have been right in step. It's, it's been a terrific relationship. Vogel song offers, and it's inside to Ryan Hannigan. But yeah, it was uh, it was tough we here. Uh, we had Pirate City 1969 out there. But uh, it was it was still it was still an, an upgrade from Fort Myers in that we had all these different fields, the quad fields out there and we've added more. We've added a half field that guys can work on here right outside McKechnie. So it's 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 been great. This I mean this is just delightful to be here. And all you have to do is look at those crowd shots and see the people. They're, they're out in the sun watching baseball. Of those I've talked to attending games, three quarters are from north and mostly from Pennsylvania. But there's no greater tonic than to be out here in the sun. You can have seats in the sun or in the shade. Doesn't make any difference. You're just... Looks like Mark Melanson. Yeah, he's throwing a 30-yard down and ends. It looks like a football field, but they can... They do just a lot of things on that. They uh, work on their running, their sprints, their leads, breaks, and a lot of stuff I don't understand. Initially, it was um, indicated to us he would get an inning in today. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that uh, they, they've got a master plan about every day in March in terms of what they want to do. The only disruptive thing is the weather. If you get some rain. You can see uh, Ryan Vogelsong looks a little weary. He's standing up. He's getting the ball up a little bit. So uh, he'd like to just grind this out. He's got an out. Get him, get him a ground ball somewhere. Outside okay. ball four. Yeah, he's laboring now. That's Jim Fuller out in the bullpen. He would uh, finish up this inning. If Vogelsong gets past that pitch count, Steve was talking about around 55. So probably his last batter, you'd think, right? Yeah, I would guess he's got to... He's got to get this guy to stay in now. If, even if he gets him, uh, he, he might depart. So you always like to have a little tight finish. But uh, uh, that would be more important for a young kid trying to make the ball club. Ryan Vogel's song is going to be on this baseball team. So you think the main thing they're watching is control or velocity? Both. Both. They're keeping an eye on because he's not a kid. Brennan Bosch sends it up high. That's, that's large. That is, <laughs> come on down. Okay. Figure off. And so two are out with the bases loaded. And that will bring up Marrero. Well, there's Anna Maria. Island. That, that is a special, special place. It's just uh, one of the real delights. It's ranked among uh, beach vacation spots in the United States. You sold me. It's uh, yeah, it's 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 old Florida. They preserved it. They have protected it. Uh, we rented uh, well from 70 to 40, 30, 40, <laughs> 45 years. No taxes if you rent. No, but the rent has uh, has, has uh, risen a good bit. We actually. Bought a place down here three years ago. They weren't going to trick us about that rent anymore after 40 years. <laughs> oh, and one to Marrero. Strike two. Nice work on the corner. 
Yeah, Ryan thinking now, okay, <laughs> get this done and let me get out of here. I've, uh, I've had enough for one day, second outing, three innings. Tried it. Yep. Not a bad try. Ray Surridge uh, keeping a close eye on, on Ryan Vogel's song. He's, he, Ray can see that he's, he's a little weary out there right now. And Ryan trying that breaking ball down in the dirt. And you're, the, the more we go along in baseball recently, the more curveballs you see down in the dirt. And, uh, and the guys are swinging at him, so the pitchers keep throwing them. So uh, Ryan taking a shot there, but didn't get any offer. Perhaps the last one. Nope. So two and two with two out and the base is full. That is, uh, I believe, Carl Callahan, who works for the mayor's office. And that he wins best dressed. There's no doubt about that. Ground ball to third. Perfect. And Rodriguez steps on the bag. Perfect it was. Imperfect inning, though. Red Sox get one. And so after two and a half, three, one. Pirates Spring Training Baseball on Root Sports is brought to you by McDonald's All Day Breakfast. Breakfast has been liberated. By Bordas & Bordas, official legal partner of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Visit BordasLaw.com. And by Day Automotive. We're going to make your day. Let's go box. All right, bottom half of the third, Alan Hansen comes up. Baseball America says the fastest runner in the minor league system of the Pirates. 35 stolen bases and the league lead in Indianapolis last year. See if he can get on and show us some of that. He sure showed us earlier when he almost beat one out. That some, was disputed. I was going to say some would say the vote was, Yeah, the vote was two to one <laughs> or one to two. I guess we were overruled because we have it four to three in our scorecard. Yeah, I lose another one. That's all right. No, you actually won because the umpire agreed with you, and they rule. I'm glad you said that, Doc, because I didn't hear that from Greg originally. Inside again. Bottom of the third inning. Shopping. I always go to that store. This is Every year place. there's new stuff. This is a busy place. Oh, it is. A single strike. Hansen looked like he wanted to go to first. Maybe he will on the next one. See if we can get some lumber on something here. Am I allowed to say that? Sure. Yes. Yes. Well, it's been a drought, Doc. Uh, last two games, what we get shut out one to nothing, yeah. and then we lose four to two. Need some 
Need to get some offense going. Only a couple of home runs for the Pirates in the entire exhibition season. Mercer and Cervelli are the only two that have homered. Well, I don't think it's any secret, and we were talking about this earlier, that the Pirates aren't going to have much success going toe-to-toe -to -toe with people. You're going to have to out-pitch them and out-defense them uh, for the most part. I mean, there are going to be games when you break out, but pitching and defense. How about a hat? Adjustable? Uh -huh. Go for the black one. Yeah, confusion on that hat trick. There are uh, still people that talk lovingly about the pillbox hats from 79. Yeah. Wow. Third strikeout for Joe Kelly. I don't know whether I uh, was more Got used the to the, the pillbox uh, identification or the conductor hats from the railroad. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll be bringing those back for Sunday home games. Yeah, they had the... Uh, 71 pirate stuff for a number of years and now they're going to go to 79 okay different look Cervelli stepping in flight to center first time turns away from one that becomes ball one bottom half of the third Greg Brown Steve Blass Doc Emmerich here from Bradenton, Florida on a wonderful day. Score doesn't reflect that so far, but there is time. Strike one. Another bit, little bit of a hockey tie, Doc. Uh, Cervelli said uh, when, when he came to the club last year, talking to him about uh, his career kind of being resurrected uh, this year, this past season, because of really mainly health, but he said Jeremy Roenick, he went to dinner with him a couple of years ago, and that Roenick told him he was kind of down about not getting uh, an opportunity maybe with the Yankees. A lot of that had to do with injury, but Roenick said, you realize you're one of the greatest players in the world at what you do. And he said that conversation with Roenick uh, really uh, stuck with him and, and uh, uh, helped him along his, his career path. I'm not surprised. Jeremy is a very positive guy, and on the teams that he's played, he's always been that way. And you need guys that are inspirational within your dressing room, and Jeremy's that way. I'm not surprised he convinced him of that. Solid hit to left field, mm. and Polanco is up, wanting to move him along here. Bottom of the third, and his team down by two. That'll do it. Into right field. So effortless, that swing by Polanco. Just on it, and just a, a, a sweet, nice tempo hit for Gregory. One of the great plays last year, Doc, brought to you by Day Automotive. On July 12th last season, the last game before the All-Star break, for the second night in a row, the Bucks beat the Cards in dramatic fashion. Gregory Polanco's 10th inning walk-off single capped the three-run inning that included RBI singles by Starling Marte and Francisco Cervelli and gave the Bucks a 5-4 win. Those two games were absolutely stunning. They were so, so much fun for Pirate fans, for all of us. It's it for Joe Kelly. He's reached a pitch count.
Yeah. Play that, Steve? Yep. I think I played on that team uh, yesterday. <laughs> I think I made that shot. <laughs> um, we that is gorgeous out there, though, that island, isn't it? Magnificent down near yeah. the pier. At one restaurant out on the pier where Bob Walk goes a mm. lot, not to tip off his best spots. You've probably been there a few times too, Steve. I have every one of them out on that island. Matt Barnes comes in, 6'4", no 210. And the last year with the Red Sox appeared in 32 games, 3-4 and four with a 5.44 earned run average. All these pitchers seem to be 6'3", 6'4", 6'5", anymore. They're just... Uh, coming into spring training early, watching the pitchers work out at, uh, at Pirate City. All of them, all of them, just very, very tall, which helps a little bit in your advantage because they're throwing the ball downhill. So uh, the hitter has to have improved timing against guys that throw downhill as opposed to pitchers that throw the ball flat. One out and two on here. Foul back by Marte. Jeff Locke is the shortest at six feet. Mm -hmm. Scahill is not the tallest guy. Holscomb is, I think, 6'9". Six, six nine, six yeah. nine, yeah. But Taeon, Glasnow, uh, uh, Tony Watson is taller and bigger than people think. I mean, he's he's a, a, a horse. Mm -hmm. World of difference from Harvey Haddix and Elroy. And, yep. and Bobby Shantz was a pirate for a short time. Uh, check swing. No. You're one like, ball, two strikes. You're liking the umpires even better now. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. They've, they've, re they've redeemed themselves here. There's a, you're, you're talking, Doc, about Jeff Locke, and there's John John Neese. He's a yeah. tall guy, yeah. big guy. See, if you're from New England, you don't have to be real big to pitch. Well, the depth chart at, at pitching now, beyond... Cole, beyond Liriano, beyond Nice. Is that up for grabs or is it set? To, to, to some degree, it, it's semi-set. Let's put it that way with Locke and Vogel song. But, uh, but it's not, uh, nothing's guaranteed. I don't think uh, when you get past the, the first three guys on a lot of ball clubs. I, uh, I think they've kind of opened the door, wouldn't you say? A little bit. They've talked a little bit, Doc, about Juan Nicasio, yep. that he, he basically is one of six starters. So they're stretching Nicasio out. And I think when... Nicasio initially was signed. He was going to be a long relief man, but if he pitches really, really well this spring, and uh, I think he'd had an opportunity to he, he, land in that starter's role. He can force some things. Might be two. And it is. Short to second to first. Marrero, Mancada to Shaw, and that takes care of the third and what looked like might be an uprising. It is three to one at the end of three. Bad guys. Pirates Spring Training Baseball on Route Sports is brought to you by the brand new all-wheel drive Toyota RAV4 Drive Hybrid. 
There's so much to discover with just one tank. And by UPMC, life-changing medicine. Let's go box. Back here again on a gorgeous afternoon, three to one in favor of the Red Sox as we go to the top of the fourth. Just resting outside against a palm tree. Not a bad way to spend time. Maybe go back in and watch a couple innings later on. Freedom is a great thing. That's a pretty nice afternoon right there. It is a great thing to be joined by a three-time National Emmy Award winner. First ever broadcaster inducted in the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. The great Mike Emmerich. My gosh, what an absolute thrill this is. Fun to be here and to be in awe of the job that you guys do. Because we sit at home, and I never pretended that I could do this, and I never pretended to call a game while I was sitting at home. It's not simple. You guys you, may, you sh you may it think it simple. is. No, do you think yours is? Simple. Do you think your job is? Well, it's continuous, it's continuous action, which you guys don't have. I mean, you have that interminable time between pitches. You have to say something. How about when Bob Prince tried hockey, though? We got it. <laughs> we got it. They got it. We got it. Score. <laughs> it's a noon balloon to Saskatoon. <laughs> Mark Melanson is on and brings it in at 89 miles an hour for the first one. How this good, guy, yeah. yeah. How good was he last year? 51 saves, major league leader. All-time team record, and you consider some of the closers that the Pirates have had fouled off. As Steve mentioned, the Barrel Automotive League leader's stat. Trevor Rosenthal, Juris Familia, Brad Boxberger in Houston Street. That's a great name for baseball. Brad Boxberger. Well, Doc, I know you've talked with Melanson a lot the last few days. You had, you had a conversation with him about, what was it, a couple years ago he went? Yeah, he went, uh, he, he got in a cage and was <laughs> dropped down into the water in New Zealand, swing and a miss. And that will be that. Out number one. And retired is Lemaire. And he was dropped into this cage and put down in the water where great sharks were around. And he knew it. And <laughs> he knew it. So I guess he was bait. But <laughs> anyway, there were, uh, so I asked him this morning, I said, how big were these? He said, probably 14 feet, 15 feet, somewhere in there. Well, this is a guy that works in the shark tank, PNC Park, you know. <laughs> and... Any closer knows danger. Well, that's true. Just like goalies. I, yep. Ken Tacalvi comes to Penguins games and wears a Marc-Andre Fleury jersey sometimes. Now, I think there's a bond between goalies and, hmm. and closers in baseball if they, if they care about the sports. Outside with that one. So one and one with one out here. Doc, why don't they have just massively built goalies that are so huge <laughs> that, that nothing could... Have they ever thought about big guys that could maybe do a better job of just taking space away? Well, what's happened is uh, the evolution now. We have uh, Ben Bishop, who plays for the Tampa Bay Lightning, got to the final last year at 6 feet 8. Mm -hmm. And so there, it used to be that you would think a guy 6 three or more could not handle the mobility of the position, but that's not the case. Swing and a miss, and so this is happening remarkably quickly and very efficiently and hearteningly for all of us. Two up and two down and on strikeouts. This is clinic stuff. The off-speed pitch way out in front. Mark Melanson is just been an absolute delight. And how about Neil Huntington when he had the uh, the fortitude, the wherewithal to make changes with his closers along the way from Hanrahan to Grilly to Melanson and believed in Mark Melanson. And, boy, how that has really turned out. It's 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 been fantastic. And those guys did good jobs. I mean, they weren't the easiest decisions to, for Neil to make. Uh, they, they did good work for the Pirates, but uh, Mark's really, really on his game. Yeah, I got that one, too. Yeah. 89 miles an hour. He and Watson have been quite a tandem. I think they're the best in baseball, eighth and ninth inning men. Tony comes in, and you just, uh, things are in hand. You don't really worry too Composure much. Composure is phenomenal. Almost struck out the side. A ball and two strikes here. Even in a spring training game, performance like this can be uplifting. I realize that you don't look at these things the same way that you do in regular season, but might be something that would inspire the fans. 
of well, which I'm one. Yep. You want to see your good guys do well. I don't care whether it's Christmas Eve or wh whenever it is. Uh, you want to see them in spring training look like the guys that you saw do so well the year before. The 2-2 two -two pitch. <laughs> yes, he struck out the side. A dozen pitches, and he walks off, and we head to the bottom half of the fourth. The Red Sox three, and the Buckos one. To the game for the latest edition of the Penguins in the room. Head to the practice rink with Jim Rutherford to watch his son play hockey. Get a cooking lesson with Brian Dumoulin and much more. In the room today after the game on Root Sports. Brian Dumoulin from Biddeford, Maine. Part of that Penguins team they lost last night. One of the better teams since New Year's Eve having won 18 of 30 games. That one fouled off to begin the inning. Michael Morris is up. Morse had a double and a single Sunday against Houston, a pinch hit single Monday against Philadelphia. And they were all three solid hits, no scratches in the bunch, but a ground out in the second inning this afternoon. You one pitch. You learn the umpires, don't you? That, and this is not a criticism. It's, uh, it seems like it's a late strike call. Well, the arm goes up a little bit oh, later. Oh, yeah. yeah. There are guys that, uh, that are longer than Hallion uh, before you can get a reading sometimes. Oh, and two, and way outside. Had a chance to sit next to the guy that operates the electronic part of the scoreboard at Wrigley Field last year. And oh, wow. he talked to me about the umpires and how their, how their hand signals are, are different. He said, I've got almost 98% of them down where I can have the ball or the strike up there about the time that they're coming up with a signal or non-signal, but he said there's still a couple that fool me. Steve, who was the guy, the veteran umpire who retired a couple years ago, who, uh, Doc, it was, he was the worst. Uh, doggone it. Oh, yeah. Uh, Wendell Stat? No. No, uh, he, he, but he would, yeah. he, because our, our location is oftentimes right behind home plate, it, 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 we're, we're Tim McClellan. Yeah, he just he, he would do it up himself. in front of his chest. Yeah. Great, that helps, yeah. doesn't it? And he, and he <laughs> took forever to make any motion. Swing and a miss. And so Morris goes down. First hitter here in the bottom half of the fourth. Yeah, those are the guys that uh, drive you crazy. And then, uh, Well, your location in Pittsburgh is high. And very, so very a lot high. of times, if they shield their call, they've really shielded it from you. Yep. Fortunately, on television, you can get the center field camera that will help you a little bit. But and uh, you usually wait for your play-by-play -play guy to, 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 to do it because it takes so darn long. You Everybody wants to jump in and, and, and get the call and, and holler out what's going on. you got to wait. Danny Ortiz grounded out to second back in the second inning. 
I know this, Doc, that uh, that Greg and, and the play-by-play -play guys really struggle with balls going up in the air in PNC Park. You don't know how they're how far they're going. You know they're up in the air, but is it halfway to Monroeville or over the shortstop's head? Well, that's the mystery. Because we're so high. How you guys do home run calls, I don't know. Because of the height. Strike. Well, how, so it's one and one with one down. You watch the outfielders mostly to, well, to but get how, a read. Uh, for, for Doc Emmerich to, to, to ask that question to, and, and for a, a hockey fan to listen and watch Doc Emmerich as he flawlessly calls these plays and the players when the puck is, I mean, it's flying at an unbelievable rate. Just, it's a marvel. Ground ball to short. Marrero to Shaw. Uh, you have help. And when you're working with somebody that, like Eddie Olchek, it helps because we often have deflections. You don't see guys coming down the wing and blasting shots in that are very easy to see now. A lot of times it's around the net. Everybody's reaching for it or you have deflections. And you try to identify, but sometimes you get help and he'll point to his lineup mm -hmm. or he'll point yep. to something. That helps you look brilliant. And Pat Summerall at one of our seminars when I was doing some football always said you have more time than you think. And on television, you do have a little more time than you think, especially with radio. You feel like you have to beat the crowd to the punch, mm -hmm. but high and causing Rodriguez to turn away. I asked Rodriguez before the game, who has made the greatest difference in your life to get you to where you are today, a major leaguer? And he talked about his father, Johnny Rodriguez. He said today he's in Jupiter with the Cardinals. And it was. That's a strike. It was not something that he said. He said it was the way he was every day. He would go and he would have clinics and batting cages. And maybe a parent couldn't pay for it that day. The kid got the clinic anyway. He said it was the example that he set every day. And that's what I watched growing up, and that's what's got me here. And that one is going to be, if the sun prevails, and it did not, that's the third out of the inning. Four innings have been played here. It's the Red Sox ahead three to one. Spring training baseball brought to you by McDonald's from McKechnie Field in Bradenton, Florida. A 3-1 Red Sox lead. And before the game, our buddy Steve Young down from Pittsburgh throwing out the ceremonial first pitch. His brothers Tom and Chris were here. Steve, a Gannon College product out of Baldwin. As uh, one of the great people you'll ever meet. And it's neat to see him throw out that first pitch. And you know what that's like, Doc Emmerich? to throw out a first pitch. It's not as easy as it looks. No. There's a lot of pressure. I found out 20 minutes before I was to do it in 08 before a game at PNC Park. Yeah. Pressure goes to the hands. Hockey players find that too. And I, I was advised to lob it in, and I did. And it was close to the plate, but inside to start the top half of the fifth. Uh, Just didn't get the call, huh? No, I didn't get the call, but it was the, the it was the parrot that was receiving the pitch, and so it's nice to have an eight-foot target. <laughs> Swihart in and 
standing in. He has two hits today, both doubles. That's up the middle. Big day for him. Designated hitter. Who's that guy, David, they have? Yes, that's <laughs> Going right. Going into his last year. How about three that? for three. He'd like that, wouldn't he? He did make the trip, David Ortiz. And announced on his 40th birthday, I think November the 18th this past year, this would be his final season. 14 consecutive years with Boston. 37 homers last year, 180 RBIs. The DH, David Ortiz. Talked about streets being named. Chances yeah. are there'll be one right. if they haven't all been taken around Fenway. Yeah. He's going, and Cervelli's throw on the hop. Whoa. Safe. Made it closer than we thought it was going to be. There's all kind of Made it traffic. closer than Jared Hughes thought it was going to be. Well, he had yeah. almost picked him off. A lot of congestion around home plate. And Yikes. Yeah, Jared, get that shoulder out of the way. Failed to mention here at the start of the inning that Hughes has come on here in the top half of the fifth. Mark Melanson was just unbelievably good in his inning of work. Three up, three down, three strikeouts. Goodbye. These are the two guys, Melanson and Hughes, that have tried the half cap. And Melanson was saying before the game that he felt that eventually it's going to be adopted by a lot of players, himself included. And he said... It makes sense to use it. It's just that we go to our caps a lot, perspiration and all of that, and Hughes said the same thing. Right now, it's just uncomfortable to do. Little number out in front. Hughes has speared that one, decides to go to first rather than tag, and moving on to third is Swihart. Yeah, I, I would expect them to uh, be more sophisticated as they go along with the technology and get it more as, as, as more of an innocent filler that's not as obvious, maybe inside maybe inside a regular cap, with, with what they can do with technology anymore, they, they will figure it out, and it'll, it'll get to the point where it'll be something that they can use. Right now, it looks like a landing area for a drone. <laughs> Remember in 1953 that, that uh, the Pirates wore what were called coal miner hats. They wore hats that were, that were plastic, hard plastic, in the field and at bat. Mm -hmm. And it was later learned that Branch Rickey, the general manager, had stock in the company that made them. Uh, which I guess, yeah. but he was just trying to protect his yeah. guys. Yeah. <laughs> Bending one in for a strike one. Well, we had to wear them as, as rookies in 1960 in the rookie league. We had to wear regular batter's helmets to pitch with. Really? Yep. 0 oh, and 1 with a runner at third, one out. Inside. Pirates playing up on the infield, hoping to cut something off from third base. Don't want to. Give up any more than they have to. They're down a couple of runs here midway through this. Shift is on. Three Pirates are stationed between first and second. Only Rodriguez on the left side of the infield. And that's a base hit to left field. Nice piece of hitting there for Travis Shaw. Can't get him out either. Home run and a single for him. And so it is now four to one. Sinker down and away. That's uh, stock and trade for Jared Hughes. Pretty decent pitch. There's the shift. And Shaw just does a nice job of going with that sinking fastball the opposite way. That's good hitting. And so why not hit it the other direction? The other side of the infield is loaded up. Push it where there's only one guy. <laughs> but, uh, so what you want to do with a sinking fastball is go that way. Is it ego that players will belligerently just try to hit through it anyway? Yeah, the big thumpers, are, they're, they're not going to change their style very much. Hitters are stubborn. But even the big thumpers, I mean, even the guys that aren't the big thumpers, yeah. let's see if John Jaso is trying to beat the shift. Jaso is not a home run hitter by any stretch, but yet they shift him, the left-handed hitting pull hitter. They've got three infielders on the right side. So he has tried to really concentrate on trying to bunt down that third base side. The 1-1 one, one from Hughes. And those kind of hitters, you're not going to hit the ball over the fence, so you're playing into the shift. I mean, you're, you're giving into it. Uh, you know, if you can hit the ball over the fence, it, it, you, know, you give them a little more um, room to, to give it a try. But a, a contact hitter? You know, there's, there's a lot of people out there that's going to catch your balls that you hit because they're not going over the fence. But they're stubborn. 
Hughes goes to work again. The one, two. Swing and a miss. And there are two down. Yeah, tied him up nicely inside there. It was in the mid-50s in Chicago, a White Sox game. I got to see Ted Williams go up against the shift. Mm. And what do you think he did? <laughs> Belligerently. <laughs> Just tried to. He tried to, but... Nellie Fox was in short right field, and, and uh, Louis Aparicio was to the right of second base, and he just blasted it at Fox all afternoon. Yeah. Ground yeah. outs four to three. This might do it for the inning. Four to three, and that takes care of it in the fifth. A run, but it is 4-1 Boston as we head to the bottom of the fifth. Lots of smiles down that row here in Bradenton, Florida. This year's Pittsburgh Pirates home run 5K 10K presented by Allegheny Health Network and Highmark is set for Saturday, April 16th. Participants receive a tech t-shirt and ticket voucher good for a Pirates game. Families can join in the fun with the Chick-fil-A One Mile Family Fun Run. And you can register today at pirates.com slash home run. Right across the Clemente Bridge. It's fun to go there and opening day. Won't get to make it this year, but I never forget two years ago when Neil Walker hit the 10th inning home oh, run. Oh, wow, yeah. I had a flight, so I had to leave before, but we were all out at one of the restaurants at the airport watching that ball fly, and it looked like the closing scene from Major League. We're all ages. We didn't have anybody with a mohawk haircut, but we had all <laughs> ages and all styles, and everybody's high-fiving everybody else. They won the Open. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Uh, Extra inning, one nothing final, that home run by Neil Walker. Cole Figueroa stands in and takes the first for a strike. Was that the, the home run when they had the camera shot from third base? And as he was running to first, everybody, they had the whole so. crowd standing mm -hmm. up. It was just a great flow yeah, of, like a, the natural. Of, a, of a video. Yeah, like, yeah. like Redford uh, up at uh, War Memorial Stadium in Buffalo. <laughs> Grounded to third. Nice spear of it. And the throw to first. Wonderful play at third by Sandoval. Looked 20 pounds lighter there, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. I didn't know. Uh, Good agility. Pandas could move that quick. <laughs> well, you know, he, he, he was one of the better defensive third basemen for a while when he was with San Francisco. Good play there. Made a bunch of errors last year, Sandoval. Looks like that's a recurring theme with him every year. Got to get him in shape. Jason Rogers in. Ball one. Edwin Escobar, 6'2", 225. Will be 23 on opening day. Was with the AAA Pawtucket Red Sox last year. 5.07 DRA and was 3 and 3. 
Big lefty comes through with another. I guess big is 6'2". Strikes me as big because I'm 5'7", but kind of <laughs> average for these guys bringing the ball across now. And he's a 6'2 that's filled out. Uh, Hughes is 6'5 and has not filled out. <laughs> Different body types. Rogers is a pretty big guy. Stockley built. 6'1", 250. Waving that black bat around. That's a ball, and that's three and one. Was a high school quarterback. Had a couple of games against quarterback Cam Newton, who went on to some very important things. Played basketball against Dwight Howard. And has drawn a walk. There is a start. You've got to get us some runs here, Doc. I need some offense. It'll be up to Brownie after this. Oh, Doc, we're going to score for you right here. Okay. Bunch. See what Hanson tries to do against a lefty. Grounded to second and took a called third strike. Be fun to see one go down the line right now and see how oh, close yeah. he could come to... Take that. That's all right. Single to right center, and so it is first and second with one out. Starting to have poten potential. Mm -hmm. We are getting to the point in the game where sometimes the Pirates make changes, but I don't think they're going to change any batters. It's going to be when they go back out to the field, and Cervelli is up. Two men on and one out. Yeah, nice job there by Hanson. That ball out away a little bit, not trying to do too much in terms of pulling it. Hanson, that's uh, seven hits now for him in 14 spring training at bats. Really what this guy needed was a chance, and he wasn't getting it with the Yankees. Got 128 appearances last year, 124 starts, and that's the most since Jason Kendall in 2004. There's another guy, Doc and Steve, that... Is just Jason was one of our favorite players just because of what you said about Cervelli earlier in the ball game about uh, he, he, he wants to be part of the action. Mm -hmm. uh, hockey player type attitude. Kendall was like that. Not many catchers lead off either. That's right. The 1 0 to Cervelli. 1 1. And the thing is, he got beat up. Uh, we're in an age now where there's a lot of balls thrown in the dirt and they get, they get chopped up with those, blocking them. They, uh, there's only so much protection that equipment can afford you. So it's uh, it's work during the grind of a major league season. And he was remarkably healthy. There's so many times he went down, we thought he was going to stay down, but he always got back up. He always got back up last year, all season long. And uh, that was huge uh, for himself and for the continuity of the pitching staff to, to be able to work to him night in and night out. And uh, those, those patterns become ingrained between catchers and pitchers. And, uh, and he had the perfect backup, Chris Stewart. What a, what a great tandem. Chris moved right in there, and uh, he really didn't miss too much. This is unfortunate. Here. Might be too. And it is, and that takes care of the fifth. Guys, I thank you very much. I'm not leaving not yet. Really but no, no. <laughs>
4-1, sixth inning. Pirates and Red Sox here from McKechnie Field in Bradenton, Florida. Along with Doc Emmerich, Greg Brown and Steve Blass, and Larita Cabana out on the boardwalk. And another, again, I can't repeat it enough. What a spectacular day. Of course, in Pittsburgh, it's, uh, for we understand, mid-70s. Spring-like day in the Berg. And a bunch of changes, including Archimedes Caminero on the mound for the Pirates. Throwing to a new battery mate, Ed Easley. Greg, you can run down the changes. I know Morse is still in there. You go Good for call, it. Steve. You're right yeah, on it. Okay. This is where Greg really dazzles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I is, dazzle thanks to yeah. Jason Steele, who puts up this graphic. <laughs> so it's Max Moore off at second. Pedro Florimone at short. Dan Gamash is at third. In the outfield left to right, Jake Gobert, Adam Frazier, and Harold Ramirez. And Ed Easley behind the plate. And of the new guys, you're looking at Pedro Florimone as maybe an outside shot at making the club out of spring training. The others are up and coming. And, of course, we saw Archimedes Caminero put together a fine rookie season. Pirates are counting on him to be part of a, what they hope will be a dominant bullpen. And down on strikes goes Devin Morrell. Let's go downstairs to Robbie Inspikowski. Greg, I'm here for our McDonald's player interview. We have Jared Hughes who threw the last inning. Jared, how are you feeling so far in spring training? Feeling good. Just making the adjustments to get the ground balls, get back to where uh, I need to be for the season. Adjustments to ground balls. You're Jared Hughes. That's what you do. What adjustments do you possibly make given the success that you've had getting ground balls? Well, yeah, I mean, you kind of uh, you go out there and you give up some fly balls and you start making the adjustments that the coaches tell you to make. And uh, for me, just getting on top of the ball, getting down, making sure that sinker's staying consistent at the bottom of the zone. So four of you guys are coming back, Melanson watching yourself and Kevin Arrow, who's on the mound right now. The other spot is TBD in the bullpen. But the two new guys, Nicasio and Feliz, what can you tell us about what it's been like working with them? Oh, they're hard workers, positive guys. They just provide, uh, I mean, they, they fit right in into the shark tank down there they've got great attitudes uh super positive and uh they're gonna they're gonna really help us out this year what kind of stuff does each guy bring uh, they got some noise that's that's for sure they bring the bring the loud uh loud fastballs and uh and to with that i mean i know nicasio also is getting a bunch of grounders i've seen him doing that so if you can force the ball on the ground with a hard heavy fastball that's good news What's the evolution been like for you here in a Pirates uniform? From a guy who's been up and down a couple of years ago, it happened so many times. Now your guy, this team is depending on. How do you describe the journey? Uh, don't take anything for granted. I mean, this is something that uh, is a gift to be able to come out here and play a game for your job. And every single day, beautiful weather, you know, this is wonderful. I'm just uh, taking it all in and enjoying every day of it. Anybody that knows or has spent any time around Jared Hughes knows you are the ultimate optimist. How, optimist, uh, how optimistic are you? for the 2016 season for this team coming off 98 wins. I'm World Series optimistic. I'm World Champion optim optimistic. This is, the, this is the year for us, and we're going to go out there and get after it. All right, Craig, Doc, and Steve, how do you like this guy's optimism? It's amazing, isn't it? Jared Hughes, off our McDonald's charts. player interview. Off the charts. One of our favorites yep. of all time, Jared Hughes. Yep. And he should have had a strikeout in a previous pitch. Yeah, our team is coming arrow. In fact, on the 1-2 pitch to Ryan Lamar, delivered a pitch, and the home plate umpire Tom Hallion barked as if he had called it a strike which would have meant the strike three. And Caminero looked out toward the, the scoreboard and left thinking it was strike three. I, I think that it's possible that Tom Hallion got the count wrong because he barked like he called it a strike, and it, was, it should have been strike three. Yeah, well, easily was two steps toward third base trying to throw the ball down to third base when he finally held on to it. <laughs> easily, easily kept turning around and, and yeah. asking Hallion about that count. But it's spring training. Of course, uh, a regular season game. Clint Hurdle would have been out asking Tom Hallion about that. Now, we say it's spring training, but uh, Doc and Steve, it's easy for us to say that, but for a guy like Caminero, he knows he's on the club. He would like to have had strike three, would have been two back to back strikeouts. Runner goes. And a safe call there. Easley's throw late to Pedro Florimone. Yeah, and uh, Greg, I was down here before the game started out at Pirate City, and every day part of PFP, as you watch this stolen base, was uh, CRG, a session either uh, in terms of seminar-type format, talking about it or going out on the field working. CRG, controlling the running game. The Pirates have to be better at that. And uh, spending a lot of time, a lot of time uh, doing that. So, and they need to be better. 
they need to be better. That was uh, that was a base that was stolen on Caminero with a very good jump. And you hope uh, it, it doesn't get away from from Caminero again. He thought he had Lamar rung up, and he's thinking about that. And Lamar then gets the hit between first and second. Then he gives up the stolen base to him with Juan Moncada at the plate. Look out. Talk about sawing somebody off. Mm. A broken stick, in this case a broken bat. And you go back to, to the running game, it's, it's still, in my mind, 90% on the pitcher's shoulders. Most major league catchers, if not all of them, can get the job done throwing the ball to second base if the pirate pitchers and all pitchers give them a chance to do it. It's to me it's as simple as that. And that's that's something that needs to be part of your craft. And the the starters work on it probably more. They could work on it even more than that. The relievers, uh, most of them are not as good as they should be holding runners on. And they're in there many times in the ball games on the line. And still two and two in Moncada. Well, that part of the game hasn't really changed since no. the time that you pitched. No, no, it's been that way. It's the responsibility of the pitchers to, to primarily control the running game. You show them different, even if you don't have a real quick move, show them different things. Spend more time at the set position. Uh, go quickly from the set position. Uh, step off. Throw over there. Uh, vary your looks, as they say. Vary, vary right? your looks. Many times, the longer you hold the ball, the guys get so antsy when they know they're going to try to run. They'll, they'll commit early or, or, or it disrupts their timing. What you want to do is avoid doing the same thing, delivery after delivery after delivery to home plate. Then they can work their patterns and their timing. But uh, you vary the looks and vary the things that you do, uh, and you don't have to pick people off. And uh, it's, 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 it's just being conscious of that and how important it is. The situation in the ball game, whether the game's on the line or not, there, there are factors that go into it. But through constant work, you can get better at it. I was fooling around with the pitchers because I had a wonderful balk move that I, that I used to get away with. For 10 years, I never got called with a balk. And I would, if I was trying to get a guy at first base, I would just, I would throw before I stepped to first base. And it's a blur, just, just real, real quick. And the umpires see it as a blur and you won't get called on it. It's illegal to release the ball before you step that way as a right-hand pitcher. So it's a little quirky thing. So you knew you were balking? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew it, was, but I but I but I blatantly balked so many times because I didn't come to a set position. I came and kind of bounced instead of stopped, but it was something I did all the time. So it wasn't out of the ordinary. And many times, if you do something and, and it's part of your part of your whole uh, rhythm routine, uh, you won't get called on it. Here's a guy that got, earned a nickname oh. several years ago, Balkin Bob Davidson. They restructured the balk call. Well, maybe. 25 years ago or so that I remember the Saturday afternoon that Jim Gott got called for yeah. like six balks in one inning they, they I guess they told the umpires at the time we, we really want you to pay closer attention to it and Davidson took it to heart and he earned the nickname that year balking Bob Davidson yep. it was a Saturday afternoon I was in a car it was after I got the after I got through playing and uh, just listened to the radio and balk after balk Jim Gott I'll never forget it I, I balked one time, Doc, and I screamed at whoever umpire was. I said, what did he do? He said, you balked. I said, well, what did I do? He said, you balked, and it just escalated. I, I, I darn near got thrown out of the game. I, I wanted to know what I did. Because you can't argue a balk call. No, if he tossed. says you balked, you know, yeah. You have to accept it. Yeah. Oh, diving stop at third by Gamash. His throw first late. Morse does a nice job to keep it there, but Gamash saves a run for the time being. Nice stop. Just barely gets the fair call on it by third base umpire. Is that Phil Cuzzy? That's Bob Davidson. Bob Davidson, yeah. which, yeah. Bob well, Bob there's Davidson. a Gamash little uh, goaltender action yeah. there. Yeah, he was a hockey player in Rhode Island until he was a freshman in high school. Left shooting defenseman. How about Looked that? like he could have been a goalie. Good mobility there on the part of that guy. Was saying before the game that one of the appeals of going to Auburn as opposed to a New England school was longer season for baseball. Hmm. Field doesn't freeze hmm. over as quickly. 
<laughs> good mobility there. Right. But but your your motion was such that umpires could probably be fooled anyway on what your normal motion was and and whether there would be a balk thrown into it or not. Yeah, I was all over the place. Uh, there was nothing very stylish about it at, uh, at all. It was like a barn full of owls, uh, as Bob Prince used to say, <laughs> uh, cut loose. And uh, yeah, so uh, it, it's hard to say that uh, that that you're doing something out of the ordinary when everything you do is out of the ordinary. <laughs> we, uh, we need something dramatic here. Well, yeah, we? uh, you hate to, to point to that one call, but yeah. you could tell Caminero is, is just not the same guy now. Yeah, and that was... Just, uh, he's rattled. That was two up, two down strikeouts. Yep. yep. And now it's evolved into this. No excuses. You got to come back from it. Blake Swihart, two doubles, a single, a couple of runs scored. RBI and a stolen base. A big day for him. Tom Hallion calling the balls and strikes. Caminero, the fourth pitcher to work for the Pirates today. Vogelsong went three. And that could be an inning-ending DP. Something dramatic. Slick looking, but Florimon's throw pulls Morse off the bag and a run scores. And this is so unusual. Florimon actually has done a nice job this year at the plate this spring. And it's his defense that has gotten away from him. That was so easy. This is a tailor-made double play. It's, it, they got all the time in the world, and it's a, a playing catch with the first baseman, and they don't get it done. And uh, the Red Sox add on. But kind of bizarre. I mean, his floor has been known That's as why he's in the big leagues. outstanding defensive yeah. player. That's yeah. right. That's what's gotten him to the big leagues on occasion. Sometimes you just have too much time. You start thinking about things that could be wrong instead of just letting the instincts take care of it. Oh, oh boy. Pablo Sandoval gets into one, but the wind knocks it down, and it's called fair to the surprise of Harold Ramirez, the right fielder. And they better stop play because he was on his way into the Pirate yeah. Clubhouse down there. Phil Cuzzy, who went out there, calls it a fair ball, and it turns out to be a double. Boy, oh boy. Doc, Buckos aren't getting any calls. Now Ramirez thinks it's a foul ball. As you could see on the replay, it didn't kick up any chalk, and it was foul. So Ramirez just assumes it's a foul ball. He's not going to chase it. But instead, it's called fair. And a 6-1 Boston lead. Oh, Opening day, ball. ladies and gentlemen, is April 3rd. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> For everybody. It's what it is. Yep. Now, we'd be really upset if this were a regular season game, yeah. but. Yeah. yeah, we're just. Well, the sad thing is it seems ticked. like piling on after this, yeah, yeah. this length of time, yeah. but. Travis Shaw has homered, walked, and singled. Hit the home run in the first. Wind aided, perhaps, off of Ryan Vogelsong. Well, Caminero getting an extended outing. And they won't let him throw much further, uh, many more pitches, should this continue. They know what he can do. They, he doesn't have to stay out there. Yeah, he had uh, several multi-inning relief appearances last year. They don't want him. I, I would think they don't want him throwing 30 pitches. Well, I mean, they, like work. everybody, they've got pitch counts, every one yep. of them. Yep. And that's called foul. Much to the delight of some Pirate fans. Ah. Speaking of delight, <laughs> it is getting warm this afternoon. Bright, sunshiny afternoon. A 6-1 lead for Boston. Some disappointed Pirate fans. Well, it was a raw call earlier, but you can't let that That's totally right. kill you. Can't I mean, well Earl Weaver came out in the first inning and talked about <laughs> Rule 801, right? Yes, he did. Didn't ruin the day. <laughs> yes, he did. Right? Yep, yep. Did not ruin the day. That was in 71. Just yesterday. Look out. Shattered bat. 
yard sale. <laughs> Four three put out. Uh, Doc Emmerich talking about rule 801 from the 1971 World Series where number 28, Steve Last star, the final out. Bucks yeah. win the series. <laughs> yeah, hold on, Robbie. <laughs> Six one ball game. Heading to the bottom of the sixth. Hey Doc. <laughs> <laughs> Away for Doc Emmerich. It's nice. Joined in the booth by this great broadcaster and so many tweets. Pirates fans are learning what hockey fans have known for a long time. Doc Emmerich is an absolute treat to listen to. Thanks, Root Sports. Extra love for the booth today. Always love G. Brownie Points and Steve, but Doc Emmerich has made my day. If I could listen to Doc calling Pirates games every sunny 71 degree afternoon, that would be just fine by me. That's kind. This is the one. No, this is the swan song. But it's been fun doing, and it'll be fun, especially if we can get a few runs here. Well, Doc, you kept it close. Uh, Greg has <laughs> let it get, got, it, yeah, I've let away it get a away. Bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. At least, Doc, give us the option of bringing you back up on occasion. Okay. All right? Yeah, 24-hour recall. That, yeah. that used to be what you did. You send a guy down. I mean, we actually kind of felt badly, Steve, asking Doc to even do this because here he wants to just enjoy some off time before he goes back up to, I think, the next game. Are you doing the Ren uh, Rangers-Pens game? Sunday afternoon, Sunday afternoon. Yeah. So he's, you know, NBC's been kind enough to give him some kind of extra time, some leeway this March so he can watch his buckos, and we're asking him to come into the booth. Well, wait a minute. He's a work. rookie. We'll tell him what yeah. to do. <laughs> this, yeah. You, you, the veterans tell the rookies what to In do. In fact, you'll find him. I will find him, just like I did at fantasy camp. Repeatedly. I tried to draft him uh, early on my team, but he's already gone. Well, See, Doc, there's a start. Well, Doc, this is Harold, Harold Ramirez. Hot bat. This is fun to watch. Harold Ramirez, as uh, Neil Huntington said a couple of weeks ago, this guy can flat out hit, and that's all he's been doing this spring. Harold Ramirez, the Colombian native, is now 8 for 13 at the plate this spring. That's pretty easy math over 500. <laughs> you, got, you got a hot bat. Led the entire organization in batting average last year. 337. In the last three years, it's gone up each year. This is a stock you want to buy. Yep. And we almost lost him down the right field corner a moment ago. <laughs> I didn't know if he was coming back. He was 34 plate, uh, plate appearances shy of qualifying for the batting title last year but missed some time with an early season injury and also played in the Pan Am games in Canada mm. as Jake Gobert drives one to center. Again, the wind knocks it straight down. Hey, Doc, I can't let you leave without uh, getting your impressions of Roberto Clemente. He was just fascinating to watch. It was I never, ne never met the guy. I was just a fan at that time, but I would always watch him during the game. 
During the pregame, I would watch Maz because I was a second baseman in high school, and I'd take my glasses off because I couldn't see very well. And I'd just blur my vision enough to watch the infield drill and see how that ball would go 90-degree angle when Grote would throw it to Mazeroski and on to first in the infield drill. But I'd watch Roberto between pitches. There were no mascots, and there were no fancy things going on in stadiums at that time. But you would just see, now, why is he moving that direction? But he, he knew. Yeah. He was magic. And you, uh, there's a prob- There's a real problem right yeah. there. <laughs> Harold Ramirez, where is he going? Yeah. In the ending, double play. The great one, Roberto Clemente. And we're seated next to another great one, Doc Emmerich. 6-1, Sox. It's time for our Allegheny Health Network injury update. And unfortunately, the subject of that update is outfielder Austin Meadows, who suffered a right eye injury yesterday. The initial battery of tests showed it was an orbital fracture. He suffered the injury playing catch, and there's no timeline set yet for his return. Neither has a determination been made yet as to whether or not he will undergo surgery. Now, due to the swelling, he will be examined in Pittsburgh early next week. So, Greg, Steve, and Doc, not good news down on the farm for Austin Meadows, the Buckos' first-round pick three years ago. That is too bad, Robbie, but um, it's reminiscent, really, of uh, the injury that A.J. Burnett suffered shortly after Mm -hmm. he joined the Pirates, traded over from the Yankees, and uh, he was involved in an early spring training uh, bunning exercise and bunted the ball into the ground, back up, and hit him, and... Shattered his uh, orbital bone. He flew up to Pittsburgh, had surgery on it, and they did such great work. At uh, AGH, he was back relatively quickly, so uh, we'll hope and cross our fingers for the same results. There's Josh Bell taking over now at first base. You know, I, I'll tell you, it doesn't take much. If you get hit by a baseball, to, it is so hard to, to have something serious happen. Even playing catch, it, 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 is, it is, is instant damage. If you hit on a bone, it's a hard baseball. You, almost if you, if you get a ball, you want tissue, but then it's bruising and you miss a lot of time because of that. So it's not good hitting, getting hit. He's ranked number two, and we get those programs here that we buy coming in, and we get all of the rankings of the upcoming prospects, mm-hmm. and he's ranked number two, a five-tool player. They sure hope. He recovers quickly and gets back out of that field. Guys like uh, Austin Meadows, the outfielder, uh, Reese McGuire, the catcher. They're down the road a little ways, whereas Josh Bell, now at first base, figures to be part of the Pirate plan, uh, perhaps as early as sometime this year. 
you look at how close guys like Bell, Hanson, Tayon, Glasnow. Lined off of O'Flaherty's glove. And here's a candidate for the Pirate bullpen. O'Flaherty's been around eight years. I mean, he is a major league veteran, left-hander. Uh, that's, a, a, that's a combination. If, first of all, you're left-handed and you're upright. And then you've been around long enough to prove that you can get the job done. Pretty good chance of, of you getting a major league job. So we'll see how it plays out for O'Flaherty. Yeah, that was uh, a... Look at this is playing out nicely. Yeah. <laughs> that's an afternoon nap. Both parties would like to be doing that. You know, just lay back and... Enjoy. See, this is a guy that used to come in in the eighth inning and get the lefties out. Oh, yes. In key man. situations. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Big years with the uh, Atlanta Braves. And uh, he's just dreaming about. He's going to be those a big days, leaguer, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's going to be a bigger leaguer in about 17 years. Marco Hernandez is at the plate. His first at bat. After they, that uh, St. Patrick's Day matchup of Ryan Hannigan against Eric O'Flaherty. And Hannigan won that matchup with a base hit, so he's aboard. You see Ruben Amaro Jr. coaching first base, the former Phillies general manager. Down on strikes goes Marco Hernandez. How about that, Steve? Going from the uh, is, is that a promotion or a demotion? I, I don't know what that is. You're in uniform. You don't have to dress as well when you come to the ballpark. Wear your <laughs> T-shirt and shorts. No shirt and tie anymore. Uh, meal money's pretty good. New president, Andy McPhail, now in the Philadelphia. New general manager, Matt Klentak. I don't think first base coaches make as much as GMs for some reason. Maybe not as much pressure either, right? Right. Yeah. A little more relaxed. Sam Travis at the plate. Doc, that seems to be a little, little, little bit more common. Is it not for front office types to kind of go back and forth from the bench to the to front office? In usually, hockey. usually have to, after they've removed the coach. <laughs> yes. They go down themselves. Mm -hmm. That yeah, happens uh, a lot. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you're gone. I'm yeah. coming down there. <laughs> Oh, Flaherty. Don't rush. Oh, bad angle. Late and... Yeah. Looked like he, he was out. hesitating, kind of jumpy, going after that ball when it had a little English on it. Pitchers have a tendency sometimes uh, in those situations to throw the ball right down the right field line because you know you're late and, and had to reach for it. That's, that's an awkward reach, and then you start hurrying it. That ball can easily be thrown away. So... We need another ground ball. You know, Bell is that number one prospect. I mean, the Pirates have started somebody at first base, the last, someone different the last seven opening days. I wonder who it's mm -hmm. going to be this year. We've talked about Bell coming up in mid-year at least. Mm -hmm. right but now, it's It looks not. like Jason or, or Morris, uh -huh. the way it stands now. But, you know, you never... No, we were talking to Neil Huntington. When does the phone really start ringing for him in March? He said about the middle of the month, it really starts getting hectic when you're looking at rosters, who might be available still, who you'd like to get. A lot of that has to do with uh, injuries even from other camps. Where Johnny mm -hmm. Peralta went down the other yep. day, the Cardinals shortstop, out two to three months. So you figure uh, John Mozalak is ringing other GM's phones. And... Uh, so, Clint Hurdle, who knows who will start opening day against the St. Louis Cardinals. And there's always rumors flying around. There's yeah. always rumors flying around. This guy might be available. We might be looking at that guy. And there's a swing and a miss, big second out. Johnny Peralta, our injury update, expected to miss two to three months. He has been uh, so steady over the years, whether it was uh, in Cleveland or Detroit and St. Louis. He's done damage against the Pirates. I know that. We're not celebrating another team's injury, by the way. Some uh, some Hall of Famer told me that recently. Well, I just learned that the hard way, that you don't do that. I was told very quickly. It was, uh, I believe it was something that had to do with Wainwright last year, and I thought, you know, he gave it to us pretty good in the playoffs mm -hmm. the year before. 
we won't have to face him for a while. Don't celebrate now. <laughs> Flory Moan to the shorts to a second baseman Max Moroff and a scoreless top of the seventh inning. We'll stretch here. McKechnie Field and Braden's in 6 1 Sox. Pirates Spring Training Baseball on Root Sports is brought to you by Allegheny Health Network, Health for All, and by Barrel Automotive. Our service centers are now open evenings and weekends. Visit BarrelService.com for more. Let's go Bucks! And we are back here at McKechnie Field in Bradenton, Florida. 6-1 Red Sox. Into the bottom half of inning number seven. I understand uh, you mentioned before you're going to be doing the Pens game uh, this coming weekend. Make sure you pass along the best wishes to Steige and uh, Bob Airy and the whole crew up there. And oh, say yeah. Say hello to Mr. Lang for oh, us. Oh, yeah. yeah. So and O2 Niner. O2 Niner, two -niner. Two Bulky. Niner. Yep, yep. Yeah, give them our best time. We're rooting for them. All of them. They are a lot of fun. Sidney Crosby had another point last night, just rolling along as usual. And Evgeny Malkin the same. It's the fun time. That's getting uh, getting down to cases, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Moving along. Adam Frazier at the plate for the Pirates. You saw Sandy Leone is now catching Sean O'Sullivan. So we went from Eric O'Flaherty of the Pirates to Sean O'Sullivan. We'll be yeah. on the air for St. Patty's Day, by the way. Uh -huh. Have a game for you against the Yankees. Speaking of green. You have yeah, those green are. shirts, I think. Yes. I, I was seeing those green shirts today. Yeah. I saw one, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we didn't. We, we just saw one. Swung we by just, we just one saw off one. Booth. Yeah. yeah, one. One green shirt. No, I didn't get one. I didn't get one either. Not today, anyway. This ball hit the other way by Adam Frazier. Going to drop in. All right, Doc, here we go. We've got it, business again. And as Doc Emmerich knows, uh, the, the, the young troops have come in in the second half of a handful of these spring training games and really. Uh, Gotten the offense going. Came up just a hair short against uh, Houston, I think. Yeah. It was a 10 8 game. Mm -hmm. Turned the game around, though. And was it Toronto? It was 10 3 and it became 10 8. Yeah. There's a guy that uh, Mike Emmerich was talking about a few moments ago, Dan Gamash. Ball one. Dan won the home run derby. In Portland, Maine, the league home run derby at the All-Star Weekend. Ten outs, five outs, five outs, and he won the whole thing. And he said the high, there, the walls were high, and the dimensions were not like Forbes Field, but they were deep. <laughs> not like Forbes Field. You, mm. speaking of which, didn't you march off? 
where that flag is that says 1979, way at the back there, that would be 457 feet. That was center field that Blass had to work with when he came in as a rookie. Oh, <laughs> that, that is, that that is that? back there. Yeah, I threw some uh, 450 uh, feet outs. <laughs> you know, go back and uh, Matty Alou would... You know, we almost lost him one night in, in the darkness out there. We're so far away and he's so short. Uh, but uh, you could give up some long taters and, and <laughs> frustrate some batters because it didn't go over the fence. And 436 to, to left center where Maz hit the home run, that's, that's huge Oof. in a gap. And also you go down left field line, 365, with a scoreboard to hit it over. There it so is. So that's right field down there. Yeah, look at 457 with a, with a batting just cage, cage and and, and the, uh, flagpole. the flagpole. Just keep it in play. Yeah. Just keep it in play. Hit it straight away. Somebody will run it down. So Doc Emmerich the other day decided to mark off what that might be like by comparison here at McKechnie. And as he said, that that flag out beyond the boardwalk that you just saw a moment ago, the 1979 flag, comparable to what that would be like at Forbes. That is a long tater. At fantasy camp, Bill Verdon told me that he only recalled a couple of balls ever being in play around that batting cage. Yeah, and that it just it, never got astounding, hit But that was from 1909 to 1970. Mm. Big ballpark. 3-2 and two on Dan Gamash, Mike Emmerich, uh, in case you are not aware, grew up a big Pirates fan. Well, growing up in western Pennsylvania, that's kind of the deal, isn't it? Yeah, but what about growing up in Michigan? Thanks, oh, thanks oh. to the gunner. And the runner takes off, and it's fouled out of play. As uh, Doc was telling us earlier, listening to, to Bob Prince on the radio. and So he became a Pirates fan. Uh, his brother, for some reason, a Dodgers fan. And did you did you ever make it out to Forbes Field? Yeah, yeah. That, for that one game oh, that I right, showed the you the scorecard, card. yeah, yeah. And two other games when I was teaching at Geneva College. It was just before Forbes closed. But yeah, the big light towers out there, and there were lucky numbers in the scorecard. Yep. And they would hang the numbers on the light tower between innings, and if you would win something, I never won anything. <laughs> But you would check that because there was no other entertainment between half innings. And so they would announce lucky numbers and hmm. post them out there. And that was just another of the fun thing. You could get a hot dog for 15 cents and uh, soda for 10. They, they, they were not great hot dogs. Uh, they weren't? Myron O'Briskey and the whole crew How out did there. you know? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. You, I, you're right. You busted me there because we used to send the, the clubhouse kid down uh, Fifth Avenue to George Aikens and get fish sandwiches for the bullpen. <laughs> True story. It, Did you yeah, tell me is, they changed is. the bullpens because of you guys eating? Well, the, the hot dogs used to be cooked in the scoreboard. The guy that uh, put up the uh, the sheet metal scores, the numbers, would cook hot You see smoke coming out of the, the <laughs> scoreboard, and the pirate bullpen is on the left field line, and, and relievers would go in there between innings, get a hot dog. So Danny had us change it. He had changed down the right field line. It's true. True story. That is funny. And do you remember oh. also how unique it was at Forbes Field? They had the first uh, uh, tarp that would come up out of the ground mm, down the third right. baseline. Mm -hmm. And it would get jammed every once in a while. So it wasn't just a Three River Stadium where you saw that. Mm -hmm. That was in operation at, at Forbes Field down the third baseline. Well, there was such relief from the pilot hitters when you went to Three River Stadium. The Pirates led the majors in home runs the next year after they moved in. The first full season after they moved in. Of course, they had a really good team. It was yours, and you were on your way to uh, the World Series. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the well, auction. We were, we were delighted to go from Forbes to Three River Stadium because we were going to have carpeting in the clubhouse and air conditioning. We didn't have that at Forbes. And we all thought that it would benefit the hitters because it was such a fast surface. But you'd also get more double plays as you take a, a look again at Forbes. Gee, this is fun. Those are great shots. Mm -hmm. I went back to visit, and, of course, home plate is inside one of the uh, residence halls now. Yeah, and there's a, there's a story about that, too, that the, the real home plate, uh, isn't it a library or residence? It's a building of some sort. Classroom building. A classroom yeah. building. Well, originally, it's, it's in a hallway now, but originally, to be completely accurate, it was in the ladies' room. So they moved uh -huh. it out in the hallway to, to make the story better. <laughs> well, the day I was there, the students were donating blood 
And so they had the gurneys out in the hallway right oh, wow. near home plate. And, and the orange juice and the crackers were there. And oh, kids gosh. were doing the right thing. Yep. Ed Easley at the plate, his first plate appearance. One of the catchers in camp. Mississippi State product, Ed Easley. Ball to strike. No mystery as to who will be behind the plate for the Pirates this year. It'll be the combination, Cervelli and Chris Stewart. But who's going to back up Elias Diaz at uh, AAA? Nice hook dropped in there by O'Sullivan. Uh, the art of the old slop drop slow curveball. Sangi used to call it the old Flip Wilson. <laughs> two and two. On the 30 year old, Ed Easley signed a minor league free agent deal in January. Got six at bats for the St. Louis Cardinals last year. And up the middle, and a base hit. There you go, action, action. Adam Frazier scores, it is 6-2. Following the Pedro Florimon strikeout, Adam Frazier, who led off the inning with a base hit. Dan Gamash walked, he moves to second. A little harmless bouncing ball back through the middle. Actually, O'Sullivan uh, could have gotten Damaged more. That was a high breaking ball. That was a hanger, and uh, all he had to pay for that price was a single. The Tim Wakefields of the world are pretty well gone now, aren't they? Yep. Yep. What a what a career uh, journey he had. And Max Moroff skips one to the right side. Travis throws to second for one, and that's what they'll get for the second out. Yeah, Tim Wakefield, uh, it just wasn't working for him here after a, a great start with his career as a knuckleballer. Mm -hmm. And uh, people say, why'd you, why'd you trade him to Boston? Well, you know, they're, they're such a unique breed. When knuckleball pitchers aren't effective, they look awful. But when that knuckleball is not working because they don't throw hardly any speed at all. And I think anyone involved would have would have. Uh, traded uh, let let uh, Tim go at that time but all of a sudden it started working and uh, what a career and from what I understand what good things he's done up in the city of Boston uh, outside the game of baseball well, a lot of charity work for Tim Wakefield ironically doc we used to play in some charity golf tournaments when he was in Pittsburgh he could hit a golf ball an absolute mile an absolute mile and uh, but couldn't throw very hard <laughs> see, he found a way to make some money it was fun to see the radar register on mm -hmm. on some of those and see guys if, swing and miss if, it if it if it registers yeah if it registered right yeah oh it, it makes good hitters look silly you just can't do anything with it no really r a dickey is the the guy that has uh kind of carried the torch mm -hmm. for knuckleballers now with the toronto blue jays want to saw young with the mets as a knuckleballer we might see r a dickey down the road we're going to be up in uh, dunedin in a few days there's john holdscomb that's another slow curveball dropped in. Josh Bell. Just two for 12 this spring. With three walks. Former second round pick four years ago. Switch hitter. We wondered about Tyler Glass now's couple of outings not being maybe as sharp early going of spring training, and he won't be around much longer. He'll be heading to AAA Indianapolis to start the year. And even though he knows he's not going to make the club, Steve, you've talked about how you kind of grip the ball harder as a pitcher, even mm -hmm. though you're not, you're still out there trying to impress. Well, I think the same is true with Bell, kind of gripping that bat a little harder. Yeah. You know, he knows he's not going to make the club, wants to impress as he bounces out. 
for the final out. Seven innings complete, 6-2, Sox. Inside Pirates Baseball, we take you deep inside spring training as we wire up several of the Pirates for workouts. Go inside the drills as the Bucks get prepared for the upcoming season on Inside Pirates Baseball. Spring Mic'd Up 2016, debuting Sunday after the game on Root Sports. A bunch of games on Root Sports this year, including today against the Red Sox. And yes, on Sunday, the Pirates will be here taking on the Detroit Tigers next telecast will be here on Friday Tampa Bay Rays will be here not dancing in the streets they're dancing in the seats John Holscomb coming in uh, Greg just wanted to uh, finish up on uh, Taylor, Tyler Glasnow and uh, Jameson Tay on people have been asking me all spring uh, and, and during the winter too we want to see those guys in the middle of the season uh, next year we want to see them in Pittsburgh we want to see them in Pittsburgh I hope our pitching staff, our starting staff, is strong enough where we don't need to have them, where they can have a solid year AAA. Because if we, if we don't need that, um, that'll mean the, that the existing rotation is doing just fine. I'd like to see them have a good, strong AAA season. Holscomb had an inconsistent AAA season last year after bursting onto the scene at the end of the 2014 season. You know his story, bouncing around independent league ball. What a find. And uh, some injuries last year and at times trying to find that strike zone. Can get away from him. But then he comes back and this is what is so intriguing about him, Steve. He's, you've heard people say that some pitchers are effectively wild. I think uh, he would be the poster child for that statement. Yeah, ab absolutely. He's scary when he's not yeah. around the plate. And... Uh, he got roughed up his first outing, two-thirds of an inning, gave up three runs, but then the scoreless inning last time out. And uh, that was very tidy. That uh, that at bat, uh, strike one, strike two, strike three, bang. We've got Doc Emmerich. There's the Doc, Dr. Searage. What a job he has done as the pitching coach of the Pirates as Tim Roberson hits it past Adam Frazier for a double. <laughs> Pirate Spring Training Baseball is live with the MLB.com at bat app. Stay connected all spring with radio broadcasts, video highlights, stats, news, and more. Download MLB.com at bat, the number one app for live baseball on your smartphone and tablet. A one out double. Here is Cole Sturgeon. Pablo Sandoval doubled in a pair of runs from this spot of the order. In his fourth and final at bat. Boy, in September of 14, when he first appeared, it was a game against St. Louis, and he faced three batters, and he got them all. And I thought, look at this big guy. Knife three, right, three Cardinals right down in a row. 
Josh Bell will handle that. And, and again, Doc, such a great, great story. John Holdscomb never giving up on that dream to pitch and playing independent league ball. Yeah, and you wonder, he has that kind of debut. Three up, three down, three strikeouts. Your knee-jerk reaction, who the heck let this guy go? Yeah. Well, why has he not been in the big leagues for the last five years throwing like that? And, of course, there are always reasons uh, why people are, are there and why they're not there. But uh, he, he gets that arm going straight up. It's it's coming down. It kind of slings the ball. And uh, he's downstairs. And very effective. And in the air to center. Now Holscomb pitches a scoreless top of the eighth inning. Pirates Spring Training Baseball on Root Sports is brought to you by McDonald's All Day Breakfast. Breakfast has been liberated by Kenny Ross, just ask a neighbor, and by UPMC, life-changing medicine. Let's go Bucks! Pirates and Red Sox. Harold Ramirez. Harold Ramirez at the plate. And another oh, hit. This guy he is, is ridiculous. Something else. This is a reminiscent of, uh, was it Matt Haig? Yeah. The hit machine the hit a couple of years yeah. ago. Yep. Yeah. And go back to Mark Johnson, first baseman. One year had a monster spring training. He just keeps hitting and hitting and hitting. Six two ball game. What like nine for fourteen now, Greg? Yeah. Harold Ramirez. A story in camp for sure. Well, it, worst case scenario, they will remember what he's doing. He has put his name in front of the management and the coaching staff, and uh, they are very much aware of what he's done already. And if it continues, the story just goes. And. Always, uh, every spring training, there's various stories that emerge, like a hot minor league bat, in, in this case, uh, Ramirez. Uh, things emerge. A pitcher is striking everybody out or not, not throwing well at all. Oh, here we go again. Gobert bounces into a 1-6-3 double play. You know, we've got, what, now eight hits. It seems like we've had 1,000 people on the base paths. Right. Is that uh, three double, well, well, make it four double plays into which the Pirates have hit. Now here is Willie Garcia. 
pinch hitting. He'll get his first at bat of the day. Another pirate prospect. Well, the other good number about Ramirez is 21. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's a lot of years ahead mm -hmm. to impress this much at such a young age. And Garcia sneaks one into right. For Willie Garcia, that is his third hit in 14 Grapefruit League at bats. You know what this is like, Reese Lightning? Yes. Remember when they go live when they're dancing? So now Adam Frazier with Garcia. Seven thousand seven hundred ninety-one, a sellout crowd at McKechnie. Yep, these fans looking to see their Buckos and the uh, Boston fans that travel so well around Florida. One of the things you you love. Uh, about the intimacy of spring training ballparks. You're so close, but you also have to be very, very alert. And uh, that lends itself to all the subject of netting, protecting fans uh, around uh, baseball stadiums everywhere. Seems to be more attention being paid to that this year. I saw a stat that 1,750 people annually at baseball games are injured by batted balls. Mm. Yeah. And I understand there's even pressure on spring training facilities to yes. start putting up more nets. Yeah. I think you're going to see more and more of that. There, if you sit down in back of these dugouts, there, you don't have a chance to move th these rockets. Well, Frazier with a fly ball dropping into center field. Adam Frazier with his second hit of this ball game. And Frazier who almost won an Eastern League batting title last year. Is now five for eleven this spring. It's like you said, Brownie. The kids are showing the way here. Fun to see it. it really is part of the Neil Huntington plan, Doc. When the Pirates were going through the losing years, even after he came on board, said, I "Have to ask for even more patience from Pirate fans because I don't want." a one-year quick fix to get us out of this malaise and the streak of losing seasons. I want to be able to contend for years. And to do that, they really had to replenish the minor league system. And also, it, it requires so much patience, even now, when around the trade deadline, when teams come calling and offer maybe a, a bigger name, a, an attractive name, and you know, we, we'd like, we'll, we'll give you this guy, but we like uh, an Adam Frazier, Willie Garcia, Harold Ramirez, and Neil Huntington has been able to just hold the fort, be patient, still make deals, but not give away the farm. And 4-3 on that put, or 4-1 rather, on that put out. 6-2 ball game.
is presented by the authority of the Pittsburgh Pirates and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Bucko fans on hand here as the Pirates and Red Sox are meeting. Game number nine on the Pirates Grapefruit League schedule. 31 games. There's the Bucko GM we talked about earlier. Looks like uh, Greg Smith, one of his assistants to his right. What a job he has done. Is what an absolute job. Doug Strange in front of him, done. I believe. Uh, Neil doesn't. He deflects uh, those comments, though, and the praise toward others like Greg Smith and Doug Strange and people that work for him. But he has done just an, an, out, uh, an amazing job. It's so true. Where I used to notice it is once a summer, my brother and I were originally from Indiana, and we'd go to an Indianapolis Indians game. Mm -hmm. And boy, did you ever start to notice a difference in that team. Mm -hmm. Wasn't noticing it here yet, but the guys that were coming through Indianapolis yep. were impressive. And <laughs> a lot of them are here now. Yep. And you want a system that just kind of rises to the top and forces the guys out or away. That That's the way the process is supposed to work. Not uh, that you have to bring them up because you just have to. They're ready, and they're pushing the guys out, and they're always pushing. And they're always, that's the way you want your whole system to work. And so then you, you, when a guy is ready, maybe you move someone at the big league level and get someone in return. And the best example for me in the Neil Huntington era was the outrage when the Pirates traded their all-star gold glove center fielder Nate McClough to the Atlanta Braves to get Charlie Morton and Jeff Locke. And the guy they brought up to replace Nate McLeod was Andrew McCutcheon. Yeah. Yeah. From the minor leagues. Yeah. And then hopefully you, you send him at Nate McLeod, you get somebody that starts the process from the bottom again and it evolves upward. It's, it's the ultimate process. Well, that's the hard part of sports, isn't it? Because we're down there in the stands and we fall in love with these guys. We like seeing Absolutely. them every day and, and we like what they deliver to the team. But you have to have a, a sharp eye and a, and a cold heart about yeah, things that's sometimes. True. That's, the, that's the hard part. I don't know if you were ever given the news that a lot of hockey players and baseball players are. This is it. You're done. Oh, and, yeah. And I got whenever that happens, yeah. uh, it takes a tough guy to deliver that news because it's hard on them, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, managers have always said it is so hard to say that your dream you've always lived forever mm -hmm. is over, whether you're a young player and you get an uncondition unconditional release because you're not good enough or an old player who's enjoyed success. You tell me I can't do this anymore. It's been my life since I was eight years old. It is tough. It's tough to deliver that. It's tough to accept it. Guys have played longer than they should because they couldn't accept it. But it's a it's a it's a tough message. Tough even to say, hey, uh, we've got to move on. Your career will continue. Charlie Morton, an example yeah, of that, yeah. uh, was was told uh, the morning of, of Pirate Fest he was going to go to the convention center to sign autographs, but Neil Huntington had to call and say, you've been dealt to the Philadelphia Phillies. It's best for the organization. Mounts the third and a 5-4 put out there. Moroff couldn't get anything on that throw. And why throw it? Yeah. <laughs> But he's a youngster. He's having fun out there. Yeah, let's let's bounce things around. Red Sox with a split crowd here today in terms of uh, a home game that they're playing and then coming down here. I'll never forget, in 2004, of course, it was that miracle that the Red Sox were able to pull off after all those years, eight and a half decades of frustration. And it was hockey season. We'll get back to that in a second here. I'll let you work. No, continue. This is Sam Travis at the plate. Well, there's another 5-4 put out. This time, no throw to first. It was assigned to a game between Boston University and Boston College because we were in another one of our lockouts. Mm -hmm. And Mike Ruzioni was working the game, the all-time great from sure. the 1980 Olympic team. Bostonian, Red Sox fan, just turned 50 years old. And he sat there in the stands. The parade was going to be that day. And he sat in the stands that morning with a smile on his face and, he, and a faraway look in his eye. And he said, what do we do now? <laughs> And I said, 
Mike, you know, you might want to move to the north side of Chicago, but I don't think I would rent, I'd buy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was 12 years ago, and I think if he had a 10-year mortgage, he'd probably be just fine. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No tag sales for Mike. Mm -hmm. I, I run into him at some charity tournaments. He's done really, really well. A lot of motivational speaking, a lot of parents' work. Sean Coyle, now at the plate for Boston. And again, Trey Haley, as time is called. Ed Easley, his battery mate. Let's go out and talk to him, 25 years old. For some years, a top prospect of the Cleveland Indians organization, Trey Haley. Five years ago, switched from the starter to the reliever role, power arm. Mike, you talk about guys getting the bad news, uh, the unfortunate news that it's over for them, whether they're young or old. But what about the youngsters that get invited to the big league camp? Oh, yeah. It is so special. It is so special just to be in this atmosphere. Nice curveball there. Uh, I had the good fortune to come to the Pirates Major League Camp in 1961, right after they won the World Series. And we were down in Fort Myers, and we were in a back room, the invitees, the minor league we didn't. We hardly dared look around the corner, out the door. To oh, there's there's Mazeroski, or there's. We were just six months removed from high school, we were, barely. Yeah, and it was uh, it was just so great, so exciting. Trey Haley takes care of Sean Coyle. Uh, the Manatee, one of the sights here in Bradenton, Florida, six two Boston. Bradenton, brought to you by McDonald's. Our next telecast here on Root Sports comes up Friday when the Pirates host the Tampa Bay Rays here at McKechnie the day after tomorrow. And as we mentioned earlier, we are going to be televising the game later this month, the St. Patty's Day game. And Bones, Scott Bonnet, the equipment manager, tweeted this photo out of the uniform the, the Pirates will be wearing. Here's Francisco Liriano's uni and the green caps and the broadcasters will be wearing... Oh, another free shirt. How about this? I mean, uh, a wonderful, the, the, wonderful the, the, testimony to the St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> the doc, uh, who, who did he give this to? Who did Trevor Gooby give this to? Is that yours? This, your no, shirt? no, I didn't get one. Oh, I didn't you, either. You have one. No. Oh, doc got it. Okay, doc got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, back to the chopped liver group. <laughs> well, doc, it, it's a parting gift today. Be glad you're not getting the parting gift. No, I got one that I still remember a lot of years ago. <laughs> they said, hey, it's over. Come get your mail. Get out. One down here in the bottom of the ninth inning. And here is Ed Easley. Who singled in one of the two runs for the Pirates. It really has been such a treat to uh, have Doc Emmerich in the booth with us for this telecast. A long time 
Pirates fan and Hall of Fame broadcaster. I'll carry your messages to the Penguins when I please see them. Do. Tell, yeah, please do. Please yeah. do. Yeah. Tell the O two niner I was. Uh, yeah. I was inquiring about yeah. him, hoping he is in good health and good spirits. Literally, figuratively. <laughs> Rolled six three. Put out two away. You're okay, not worried. Getting about late. Him. We better start scoring. <laughs> You're not worried about Phil Bork, are you? No, no, I'm not worried about the old two-niner. He's, he's doing fine. Well, Doc, uh, what about a prediction for your Buckos this year? Tough division. Mm -hmm. And with what Chicago has done, I noticed Sports Illustrated ranked the teams they had out of the 30 teams. They had the Pirates fifth, and they had the Cubs first. A lot of changes that they made. Competition's going to be really stiff, but that's part of the reason that we show up and watch the games. That's right. And we'll look forward to that. And I, I love the optimism that we've uh, seen from Jared Hughes today and that I heard earlier from from uh, Clint, mm -hmm. and I'm with them. I'm with them. I, I'm very hopeful. Okay, what about a number now? How, how about a wins? How 98. About, 98. Again. All, All right. right. I like it. I like it. 98 again. That's probably not going to win the division, but oh, it might. I don't, I don't know. You know, they had the second best record you, last You're year. talking about that we, you never want to uh, applaud other teams' injuries. You also... I think you're better off not being a team like the Cubs where it seems like everybody's picking you yes. to win. Yeah, there, there's no guarantee. Those young players that are very, very good, and I think they're going to have, you know, great, great futures, but there's no guarantee. There's there's no guarantees. There's a lot of pitchers that don't know a lot about them or didn't know a lot about them last year that will try some different approaches, and we'll see if they can adjust. Yeah, it's not automatic. You have a great entrance into big league play, and, and it's just going to be you're going to run the table. A lot of people assuming that you know, Chris Bryant is going to be that good again this year, or Kyle Schwarber, or Addison Russell. Uh, the young players, they still have to go through some growing pains, you'd think. And that is going to do it. Max Moroff lines out to end it. I, I had the Brewers first, so okay. was I wrong? You had the Brewers first. <laughs> well, again, I'll tell you, you're, you're, you're going to beat the system if that well, works out that way. This was a lot of fun. What Thanks for making it treat, that way, Doc. guys. This was great for Can't me. Can't thank, thank you enough, Doc. Wonderful afternoon. It's yeah. like being invited to shag flies with a major league team, and they keep you in the lineup for two innings. It was wonderful. Thank uh, you. We Let's will uh, enjoy thanks to all. Thank seeing you. Doc a lot this spring here at McKechnie. Of course, watching him on uh, NBC with uh, Ed Olchick. Doc Emmerich, just an absolute treat to have sure. him in the booth. <laughs> and we'll talk to you again. Uh, our next telecast coming up in just a couple of days. The Pirates fall to the Boston Red Sox today by the final score of 6-2. to two. From Bradenton, Florida, Greg Brown, Steve Blass, and Doc Emmerich saying thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Friday.